Castrol Novum. Chapter 1. The Orcs and the Four Sar Sector. As the engine wind built to a crescendo around him, its bass roar filling the transport compartment so that all communications were reduced to hand signals, Captain Thanstead curled into his cramped seat inside the Valkyrie transporter. Jammed in around him were guardsmen of the 181st Elysian Drop Troop Regiment. Each man weighed down with weapons and equipment, pouches and packs, bulging with ammunition, grenades, melter charges and rations. At liftoff, the captain said a brief orison to his emperor, part of his own superstitious routine before battle, a relic of his cult imperialis indoctrination as a young conscript. The emperor embraces us at the hour of our death. Outside, uh, the Valkyrie, it was still dark. The first tinge of orange dawn has yet to peek over the horizon. It was 541992M41. Captain Thanstad's strike force was part of a deep raiding force about to drop into the heart of Orc territory on the planet Castrol Novum in the Forsar Sector Segmentum Tempestus. The Orc threat to the Forsar Sector had been growing for the past 50 years. Under their ambitious and power-hungry warlord, Garaghak, the self-proclaimed arch-killer and the overfiend of Talarax, the Orcs' usual ragged and independent tribes, clans and warbands had started to unite. The Warlord's rise was following a pattern familiar to the Logis Strategos of the Administratum, a single Orc Warlord emerging from the chaos of the Orc tribe's internal wars and divisions had become dominant, first over his own clan and then over the surrounding clans and eventually gaining enough notoriety amongst the Orcs to draw more and more warbands to his banner. When he had gathered enough Orcs under him, Garaghak's increasingly bold attacks upon Imperial worlds would gain the momentum of a full war, and when the war took them, then the Orcs would be driven into a frenzy of violence and destruction. There would be millions of green-skinned aliens descending on the populated systems of the Forsar Sector in an unstoppable tide of pillaging and bloody war without mercy. Warlord Garaghak's attacks had not officially become a full war yet, but alarmingly the momentum was obviously building behind it. Captain Sandstadt and his guardsmen of the 181st Elysian Drop Troop Regiment, supported by Space Marines of the Raven Guard chapter, were about to interrupt Garrick Hack's momentum by launching a high-speed surgical raid upon Castral Novum. Uh, colonised in M38, uh, Castral Novum was first claimed for the Emperor as a mining outpost. It was rich in phosphorus, mercury, sulphur and other useful chemical components. From the initial strip mining operations, refineries for the chemicals were soon added to reduce the mineral ore's bulk before transportation to forge worlds across Segmentum Tempestus. From these refinery operations, manufacturing soon followed, bringing in other materials from surrounding systems to produce more complex chemicals such as mercury chloride, sulphates and fulminates for use as explosives to meet the Imperium's insatiable demand for munitions. The Imperium's expanding chemical production facilities were centralised on a single continent, known as Itarina, with mining operations across the planet's habitable equatorial zone. Since first colonisation, the planet had been the target of several Orc raids, its location within striking distance of the Orc Empire of Octavius, and more recently the advent of War Skullcrack in a neighbouring sector, meant that Castral Novum required a substantial Imperial Guard garrison stationed there to protect the world. One large raid by Orc pirates caused major disruption to production and resulted in the addition of two orbital defence stations and a squadron of monitor gunships to better deter further Orc attacks. Then, suddenly, a new orc threat appeared in the Forsar system in the form of a determined assault by the rising goth warlord Garaghak. Garaghak's initial surprise landing and mass enslavement of the outpost on Thoria Free suddenly left Castral Novum's defences looking inadequate and the Forsar sector in deepening peril. 
Following his overwhelming victory on Thoria Free, more orcs were drawn to Garag Hak's success and the promise of future conquests and plunder. Soon, orcs of every clan, as well as freebooter warbands, were marching under Garag Hak's banner. Imperial Guard regiments were quickly deployed across the sector to boost garrison strengths and to help counter Garak Hak's arrival. The majority were sent to reinforce the world of Talarax, with the plan of turning it into a fortress world strong enough to deter the orcs' ambitions. Talarax quickly became the linchpin of the Imperium's defensive strategy to halt Garak Hak's rise. But the Imperial Guard commanders had underestimated the speed of Garak Hak's ascent, and as yet had failed to recognize that behind his success was a brilliant orc mind, a rare orc technical genius known as Mechboss Buzzgob. Also, Garakak saw the build-up of the Imperium's forces on Talarax as a challenge, an invite to a proper scrap that he and his orc boys could not resist. Pounded by Buzzgob's fleet and spearheaded by a horde of rickety clanking war machines, including many dreads and several stompers, Garakak's warbands attacked the fortress of Talarax head on. The world only fell into war hands after a three year war in which millions died. But with the Imperium's main forces on Talarax destroyed, the rest of the sector was now wide open for future orc attacks. The Goth warlord eyed the rest of the Forsar sector with glee. He could now take his pick of the surrounding worlds. None of their garrisons could match Garakak's large and still growing armies. After Talarax, many new warbands had also united under the new supreme leader. They were warbands with names such as Black Fingers Deaf Skulls, Lograx Bad Moons, Zargo's Flyboys, Dagrod's Killboys, and of course, Buzz Gob's Dreadheads. The next planet to face the Orc Menace was Castral Nova. The Orc invasion began with the destruction of the orbital defence platforms and the capture of the orbital extraction stations circling the gas giant Castral Decimus. All these space stations were later towed into orbit and crash-landed on the planet to be stripped for the wealth of materials and parts. The Orc attack on the Castral system, masterminded by Mech Boss Buzzgob himself, targeted the Imperium's centralised manufacturing facilities. The garrison regiments, planetary defence force, and hastily raised and trained workers' militias put up a stubborn fight, with the 49th Terax Guard providing the backbone of the defences. The Orcs paid in blood for Castral Novum, finally breaking the last of the defenders' bastions by the deployment of Buzzgob's free stompers. The stompers carried heavy firepower, which the defenders had little answer to. The survivors of Castral Novum's important Adeptus Mechanicus technicians and Administratum Prefects were evacuated from the last landing pad in the Imperium's hands. By then, many of the planet's refineries and manufactorums had been reduced to rubble and scrap in the fighting. No astropathic communications have been received from the planet since the last evacuation. For the past 35 standard years, Castral Novum has been listed as a Xenos-occupied system. Despite their defeats across the Forsar system, it had not been all bad news for the Imperium's commanders. The bloody toll extracted by the Orcs in taking the fortress world of Talarax and then Castral Novum had, for now, stalled Garag Hak's attacks and brought the Imperium enough respite to reorganize and, more importantly, reinforce. The brave sacrifices on Talarax and Castral Novum had brought the Imperium some time to bolster the next line of defenses. As yet, the Imperium had not mustered an army capable of delivering an effective counterattack or retaking any of the lost planets. But the Departmento Munitorum had searched its local strategic reserves for Imperial Guard regiments to deploy onto Forsar itself. Meanwhile, the Ecclesiarchy had raised huge numbers of Fritaris militia, and they encouraged the zealous followers of the Red Redemption cult to defend their threatened shrine world of Magdalene VIII. But the respite they had won was only temporary. The prospects of Wa Garakak were still very real. The next Imperial controlled system to lie in Garakak's path was the hive world of Forsar itself, the sector's primary planet and centre of the Imperium's power in the sector. With a population of over 30 billion souls, Forsar could not be allowed to fall. 
Perhaps worse still, should force our fall, then the next system in the Orc's path could easily be Lycia's. The principal planet of the Lycia system was Deliverance, the homeworld and fortress monastery of the venerated Raven Guard chapter of Space Marines. As the Imperium was desperately reinforcing, so Garakak, now proclaiming himself as the Arch Killer and Overfiend of Talarax, was also building up for his next big assault. He wanted Forza. His next invasion would be a war to make Talarax look like a mere skirmish. More orcs were mustering daily, eager for the big battles to come, arriving from the Empire of Octavius to join the fighting. But as his army grew, so did its demands for the material of war. All that was delaying Garakak's invasion was a problem of logistics. It fell to mech boss Buzz Gob to meet Garakak's supply demands. Since its capture, Buzzgob had established a manufacturing base on Castrol Novum, now renamed by the Orcs as Mech Slag X. Uh, shipped to the planet came the loot, plunder and scrap of the Orcs' previous victories. On Garakak's orders, millions of tons of junk metal stripped from across the Forsar sector was dumped on Castrol Novum. To the Orcs, Mech Slag X was a bonanza. War bands were sent to make use of the massive piles of fantastic scrap from which they could build all manner of war machines and weapons. Under Buzz Gob's instructions, everything from sluggers and shooters to battle fortresses and stompers were being constructed and shipped to Garakak for the big invasion of Forsar. As the Departmento Munitorum worked to defend Forsar, they were not the only ones watching the progress of Garakak. Since the fall of Talarax, the Raven Guard chapter had been aware of the Orc advance and had already been keeping a close watch on developments. The continued mobilization of Orcs across the sector meant that the Raven Guard were forced to act. The potential Orc threat to deliverance could not be ignored. Swift action was called for. The Raven Guard fully mobilized to defend their homeworld. Every company within the chapter had been brought up to its full fighting strength. Those strike forces already on deployment were recalled, including Shadow Captain Strike Strike Force, currently on an extended mission fighting Wa Skullcrack. Even before Shrike's battle barges had returned to deliverance, the chapter had begun its operations to forestall Garakak's growing Wa. Over the coming years, the chapter would begin its operations by dispatching a series of long-range reconnaissance forces deep into the orc-held territory of the Forsar system. Moving with speed and stealth, with the scout company providing the bulk of the manpower, their first mission would be intelligence gathering. Operating in darkness and shadows, the scouts had to find out what the orcs were up to, where they were strong, where they were weak, and discover where their leaders were, as well as how many boys each war boss led. It was a necessary first step before any offensive action could be taken. Each of these scouting shadow forces would have to operate in orc-held space for a long deployment, perhaps years. The intelligence gathering phase was placed under the command of Temp Company Commander Shadow Captain Corvidae. Once the chapter had received Corvidae's reports, its other captains would then plan and execute a series of their trademark lightning attacks. These would be targeted to strike at the Orc's weak points. The Raven Guard wanted to minimize the risk of facing the Orc hordes in open battle. That task they would leave to the Imperial Guard regiments which were digging in to defend Forsar. The time might come for open battle, but first they would raid deep into Orc territory. By stealth and infiltration, and then with a series of swift, powerful strikes, they would systematically target and destroy key orc bases and leaders. Squad by squad, team by team, the black-clad scouts of the Raven Guard scattered themselves across the Forsar sector, using their well-honed skills in concealment and observation to infiltrate orc-held worlds. Secretly, they set up observation posts and surveillance equipment and then vanished before the orcs knew they had ever arrived. The first phase of the operation began as the Raven Guard scouts teams landed upon Thoria Free, Castrol Novum, and at Warlord Garakak's current base on Talarax. Even as the Raven Guard watched and waited for their moment to attack, the Orcs launched an attack upon the Viridios system. 
It was a welcome diversion, led by one of Garakak's lieutenants, Blackfinger, probably as a rebellious attempt to grab some plunder and glory for himself. It ended in disaster for the orcs. Blackfinger's vessels were suddenly attacked by an Eldar fleet. Where the Eldar came from and why was unknown, but the Eldar inflicted a heavy defeat upon Blackfinger. Most of his vessels were left drifting as hulks, and no orc warbands reached Viridius's surface. After the battle, the surviving orc ships towed the hulks away, destined for Castrol Novum, where they would be crash-landed as fresh scrap. New spaceships might spring from the wreckage of the old. Shadow Captain Corvidae's scouts also observed a further development. Warlord Garakak's rise to power had not gone unnoticed within the orc-held empire of Octavius. A second great warlord arrived at Talarax in his converted space hulk. Sent by the overfiend of Octavius himself, Gograk was a trusted lieutenant, and he arrived to contest Garakak's waxing power, seeking to overthrow him and take over the growing war. Gogrok, a huge and heavily scarred Bad Moon veteran of a hundred raids and battles, arrived ready to do battle with Garakak's boys. Before he could attack, Warlord Garakak called a parley of both sides' war bosses. No one knows what exactly transpired at the meeting of these leaders, but it must have ended in Garakak issuing a challenge. The winner would take all, both warbands combining into one huge horde a horde big enough to crush the puny defenders of Forsar. None of the Imperium's scribes recorded the result, but history shows that Garakak must have won his death duel. Gograk's Space Hulk, along with its attendant cruisers, rocks, and his entire warband, estimated at between 3 million and 5 million orcs in total, hmm, all fell straight into Garakak's green clawed hands. The Space Hulk was claimed as Garakak's new flagship. He was closer to launching his invasion. At 705-988-M41, the Orc onslaught on Forsar started. The Orc fleet, led by the Space Hulks and Rocks, clashed with the Imperium's flotilla and orbital defences in a fleet engagement that lasted days, before millions of Orcs descended upon the forlorn Hive World's defensive bastions. The ground war on Forsar had begun. Even as the fighting on Forsar escalated daily, with more and more orcs landing, the reports that most interested the Raven Guard officers came from Castrol Novum. A scout team operating there soon learned that the planet had become Garakak's manufacturing base. From here, the weapons and equipment that would soon see battle on Forsar were being shipped in massive quantities. They also learned that a single powerful orc mech boss was directing the operation, and he had also begun construction on a gargant, a huge stomping war machine the size of a warlord titan and an important symbol of the war. Here was an opportunity for the Raven Guard to attack Garakak's horde without confronting the strength of his warbands. If they could disrupt the weapons manufacturing facilities, the knock-on effect would slow or stall the invasion of Forsar and buy more time to deploy fresh Imperial Guard troops and stabilise the crumbling defences. On Castrol Novum, the Raven Guard could also target the Orc leadership. It was obvious that Garakak was relying heavily upon this chief mech. Kill the mech boss, and it would be an irreplaceable loss. Despite repeated urgent requests for assistance from the Imperial Guard's commanders at the front on Forsar, the Raven Guard had found their own target. The scouts were recalled and two strike forces were quickly assembled. The first would be dispatched to Forsar to help on the front line against the tide of greenskins now sweeping from Hive City to Hive City. Shadow Captain Shrike and his elite assault talon would lead the first strike force. In return for the pledge of Shrike's aid, the Raven Guard also requested and received assistance. The 181st Elysian Drop Troop Regiment was fully equipped, trained and already preparing to deploy to Forsar. Instead, it was diverted to aid the Raven Guard's second deployment. The second deployment would be a strike force destined for Castrol Novum, again led by 10th Company Shadow Captain Corvidae. For this mission, the 181st Elysian Drop Troop Regiment, newly equipped with Valkyrie transports and Vulture gunships, would be placed under Corvidae's command. 
Between the elite Imperial Guard drop troops and Shadow Force Corvidae, they would launch a powerful raid upon Castrol Novum. The Elysian's part of the mission would be to target and destroy the Orcs' manufacturing facilities, especially the Gargan construction site. The Raven Guard's primary mission would be to hunt down and kill Mech Boss Buzzgob. Detailed planning for the attack began straight away. Using information provided by their scouts, the Raven Guard identified the centre of the Orcs' manufacturing facilities on Castrol Novum, along with the best sites for their own defendable landing zone. This would have to be well away from the Orcs, but the Imperium's forces would be completely air mobile, so the distance mattered little. The planners selected two locations as their base of operations, one for the Elysians and one for the Space Marines. These were both far from the continent occupied by the Orcs. Castrol Novum's inhospitable southern continent had never been populated, but strip mining and quarrying for ore had taken place and... After closer investigation by the Raven Guard scouts, these were found to have been largely looted out by the Orcs, and little remained. The Orcs had now abandoned them as useless. Two former mines would now become the raid's air bases. The attack force would make planetfall on the southern continent, out of reach of the Orcs, except for any roving Orc aircraft, and then quickly prepare their aircraft and troops for the drop assault. The Elysians would need time to get their Valkyries and Vultures assembled and ready for battle, and get all their fuel and ammunition supplies in place, as would the Imperial Navy squadrons that would be adding to the assault's air support. Time was critical. The longer they delayed the attack, the greater the chance of discovery, and the Orcs being pre-warned and ready. The Raven Guard gave the Elysians and Imperial Navy just three days. They would have to work night and day to be ready. At 406-992-M41, the Raven Guard strike cruiser Aragonius and its two escorts, the Gladius class Ananthia Primus and Ananthia Secondus, rendezvoused with a Imperial Navy transport convoy designated ADV-548. The holds of these free armed transports were full of aircraft, Valkyries, Vultures, Thunderbolts, even a few Marauder bombers, all dismantled. The entire Elysian 181st Drop Troop Regiment was also embarked along with support personnel and penal labourers. The vessel's navigators set course for the Castrol system and battle with the Orcs. As instructed by the Raven Guard, Colonel Tahoon and his company commanders planned their part of the raid in detail. Drawing on their schooling in the Tactica Imperium, the ground attack would be a classic hammer and anvil assault. The hammer would be the first attack, driving the orcs back onto the waiting anvil, which would be a strong stop line with heavy weapons in place, ready and waiting for the orcs to be driven into their killing fields. The hammer was codenamed Sword Force and given to the command of Captain Exist. Uh, his F company, supported by elements of G and H companies, would target the area of orc industry around the Gargan construction site. Their sudden assault, supported by Vulture and Vendetta gunships, should catch the Orcs unawares and drive them northwards onto the waiting heavy guns of Shield Force. In the process, they would overrun the Gargan construction site and destroy it with demolition charges and melter bombs. Meanwhile, Shield Force would be the anvil under the command of veteran Captain Sandstad. His would be the single largest Elysian deployment. It would be this force that engaged and destroyed the majority of the Orcs in their pre-sighted killing zones. Getting Shield Force into position would be difficult as its transport requirements could not easily be met by the available Valkyries. It would mean withdrawing Valkyrie support from other forces in order to get enough drop troops in position in time. Once on the ground, Shield Force would be mostly static, holding position around its landing zone. Being static made it vulnerable to outflanking manoeuvres. From the south, it would be protected by Sword Force's advance, and the Orcs coming from the south should already be in disarray after Sword Force's lightning assault. The northern flank would be more problematic. Orcs coming south in response to the landing fields could easily find their way into Shield Force's rear areas and attack from behind. To avoid this, a third force would be deployed, a screening flank protection unit codenamed Dagger Force. It would be built around A Company under Captain Garrick. 
they would screen Shield Force with mobile patrols and establish a skirmishing line to intercept, divert and delay any orcs approaching from the north. It was the smallest of the three drop forces, but they only had to hold long enough for Shield Force to complete its work. Overall, the mission plan was scheduled for two days of combat, then a rapid extraction back to base. A fourth, smaller force would be given the mission of base security and act as a limited reserve in case of emergency. This force would be under Captain Tahoon himself, who would not be taken to the battlefield, but would be overseeing the battle from the regiment's command post at its base. This was because the most complex part of the Elysian operation was their air plan. This would be Colonel Tahoon's main role in the mission, planning and overseeing the schedules for aircraft use. The machines and air crews would be pushed to their limits to keep a constant flow of men and equipment into the drop zones. As well as the transport plan, there were the close support aircraft to integrate into it. Vultures and vendettas, which must be given their supporting roles over each drop zone. All this had to be carefully planned, based on fuel consumption, to keep at least some support in the skies over each drop zone once the fighting started. Inevitably, the regiment would never have its full aerial power on station at any one time. The third part of the plan was the inclusion of Imperial Navy fighter squadrons, whose primary task would be keeping the skies clear of any aircraft and flying close escort for the Valkyrie formations as they made their way to and from their drop zones. The Thunderbolts would also have to be figured into the close support schedules. Finally, there was the Bomber Squadron. The Marauders were the regiment's heavy hitters, but would be of limited use in direct, close support of ground troops. Their mission would be to try to interdict the battle zone area and hit the Orcs' manufacturing facilities. They would strike deeper than the other aircraft, using the guidance of their single Marauder Vigilant aircraft to find and bomb concentrations of Orc manufacturing and pre-identified airfields. The bombers would need fighter escorts too. The air plan was highly complex, hence the need for the colonel's full attention. He would delegate his senior captains to lead the actual fighting on the ground. The 181st Drop Troop Regiment was only operating within the broader plan initiated by the Raven Guard. Before arriving on Castrol Novum, the chapter had pre-planned the attack in detail and designated the Elysian Drop Troop as their mission objectives. The Raven Guard's own forces also had their objectives. Before offensive operations could begin, they would be sending seven scout teams back onto Castrol Novum. These would already be operating in secret when the main attack began. Once the Orcs had been stirred into action by the Elysian's landings, the Raven Guard would be airborne in Thunderhawks and their strike cruiser would be racing into position to deploy their drop pod squads. During the raid, the Raven Guard's mission was to identify and eliminate the Orc Warlord's chief technical specialist. Their scouts would be seeking him out. Once located, the Raven Guard's main strike force would land in mass and attack. In the general confusion of the fighting of the Orcs, already fully distracted by the Elysians, the Raven Guard would be able to overwhelm the Orc commander's bodyguards and kill him, thus inflicting an irreplaceable dent in Garaghak's ambitions. The second objective had also been pre-identified. Scout forces had already noted the location of the Orcs' main fuel reserves. A former chemical refinery was now being used as a storage facility for massive amounts of fuel. It had also been marked for destruction, and once the battle was in full swing, a small orbital insertion force would be dropped from the strike cruiser. The timing would prevent the Orcs being able to react to the attack and give the smaller force time to defeat the guards and set demolition charges. The loss of their main fuel store should have a crippling effect, not only on the Orcs on Castrol Novum, but it would also prevent these stockpiles ever reaching the warbands fighting on Forsar. Shadow Captain Corviday would be the overall commander of the raid and the battlefield commander of the Raven Guard's main strike force, whilst Chaplain Iteth uh, led the orbital assault force against the fuel dump. Chapter 2 Drop Zone X Landings Captain Exeist unclipped himself from the narrow Valkyrie seat into which he was wedged and lurched up, hanging onto a grab rail beside the open door, through which hammered a fierce blast of rushing air that was swirled around the transport compartment like a tornado. 
The gunner, partially blocking the doorway, glanced back at him and gave him a thumbs up, grinning beneath his mirrored visor helmet, before turning back to continue scanning the ground rushing past below. Exiced leaned over to estimate the distance to the ground, maybe a hundred meters. The Valkyrie was traveling fast and low, the din of its twin engines announcing their rapid approach to drop Zone X. Suddenly, the door gunner's heavy bolter boomed a sharp burst, its shells whining away towards the ground where a huddle of orcs, or was it Gretchen? Exist uh, couldn't tell at this speed, were taking aim skywards. As he watched, fire came snapping towards the Valkyrie. One round ricocheted off the underwing with a bright spark and a metallic ping. The door gunner fired another burst back, then another as the target receded behind. Sword Force was taking fire already, and they hadn't reached the drop zone yet. It worried Exist. In his helmet communicator, the pilot announced they were 30 seconds from the target, and almost simultaneously he felt the Valkyrie's engines power down as they decelerated for final approach. He turned back and gave the hand signal for the drop troops inside to stand up. There was a bustle of activity as one after another, the guardsmen unclipped their seat harnesses and rose, weapons in hand, in well-rehearsed order. Exist and his men were in the first wave of drop troops about to jump over drop zone X, named for the captain leading the battle on the ground. This small vanguard force preceded the main body by five minutes, with the task of clearing any enemy from the immediate drop zone area, marking the area with auto-direction finding beacons for the following aircraft and deploying the tactical ground scanners. The scanners would give Exist and his air support a quick overview of where the orcs were and how many there might be. Just from his approach run, Exist already suspected there may be more orcs than his pre-mission intelligence summary had estimated. Exist jumped from the Valkyrie's rear ramp at about 100 meters. He was the last of his stick to exit. By the time he stepped out into open sky, the first of his men would already be on the ground. Even before he exited the Valkyrie, he could hear the deep thud, thud, thud of the door gunner's heavy bolter laying down a suppressing curtain of fire. The Valkyrie was hovering now, but the jet wash from its engine's turbulence buffeted the captain as he jumped clear, his grav chute unit activating instantly. He had no time to check it or to form the standard cruciform jump position. He hit the ground almost before he knew he was airborne. His ingrained muscle memory from countless training jumps meant he didn't tense on impact, making for a soft landing. Even so, the impact jolted him to the bones and forced all the air from his lungs. Without thinking, he rolled with the impact, uh, coming to rest amidst the dusty red earth. Instantly, he was up in a crouch, unholstering the last pistol at his waist and checking about him. Before unhitching the grav chute harness with its quick release buckles and shrugging the bulky backpack off. It hit the ground with a thump. Released from its weight, Exist was ready to fight. The hand-picked guardsmen of the first wave knew their tasks well. They had trained for this mission a hundred times. Sergeants assembled their teams and squads about them. Armored men were scurrying to and fro, recovering drop canisters which they cracked open. Vox sets were checked, as one by one the squads reported in to their platoon commanders. Overhead, the Valkyries emptied their ammunition magazines. The staccato pop-pop of multi-lasers was interrupted by the sudden whoosh of Hellstrike missile rocket engines igniting. The missiles streaked away into the distance, impacting in a sudden, blossoming orange fireball. Then, one after another, the aircraft banked away, engines at full thrust as they climbed clear of any incoming ground fire. Their transports were returning to base to rearm, refuel, and bring the follow-up wave of excised force. The captain climbed to the top of a low pile of junk. It seemed to be the remains of some machinery, now long dismantled and heavily rust-encrusted. Once on top, he pulled out his magnocular scanner and swept it across the horizon, pausing to focus on a distant tall structure that jutted skywards like a skyscraper under construction. The half-built gargant was a ramshackle collection of steel plating, scaffolding, chains and pulleys, and what appeared to the Elysian captain to be nothing more than accumulated scrap metal. 
It was difficult to believe that given time, it would become a massive smoke-belching leviathan of war machine, bristling with weaponry of all kinds. Turning his scanner to full magnification, he could see the smaller figures of workers, orcs, or Gretchen, again he could not tell, scurrying above over the ungainly edifice. He also noted that amongst the building-sized piles of scrap were the tell-tale barrels of anti-aircraft weaponry. The Gargan construction site was ringed with them, and more would be hidden from view. It was his mission to attack and overrun that site, in so doing driving the orcs northwards. First, he needed the main body of his strike force to find his position and jump in. Then he had to get his squads organized, deployed and moving north. It was a race against time to smash the orcs before they were able to muster more forces. Exist scrambled back down from the machinery to where his Vox operator awaited him. First platoon reports beacons are in position and broadcasting, sir, he reported. Exist nodded his approval. Confirm. Message received and understood. Get me an update on the ground scanners. How long before the calibrations are complete? I want to know as soon as any squad makes first contact with the enemy. Mechboss Buzzgob heard the aircraft approaching from the south. They came in fast, low and loud, all roaring engines and blazing shooters. It might almost have made him smile if he hadn't already been so angry. His mood was already sour. He had just finished arguing over an assignment of parts with a mob of blue-painted looters. They'd found the parts he needed for the right arm main weapon power coupling, including some almost new, shiny, heavy cabling, but they'd also had the affront to up the agreed price due to the quality of the goods. Buzzgob didn't like the Death Skulls. Few orcs did. He suspected they all worked for Skalk Bluetooth, the scabby old scrap king of Mechslag Ix, who was busy getting stinking rich whilst he was busy making the weapons to win Warlord Garakak's War on Forsar. He had sent the looters away with a warning that he'd have to report them to Overseer Gragrak if they didn't hand over his parts, and Gragrak took a dim view of pesky flea-bitten death skulls who got in the way of Buzzgob's important work. Gragrak's bully boys no doubt would find them and pull a few ears or limbs off to teach them a lesson about who they actually worked for. Still, he'd had to make sure the mob had been escorted away, otherwise Gork knew what their thieving fingers would alight upon before they left. After the brief heated exchange, the looters had finally handed over the parts in return for crates of ammunition and barrels of fuel. Buzzgob's two grot assistants, uh, Nit Knuckle and Lunk, had struck the parts off the big list of missing bits. Now Buzzgob needed a mech to get to work fitting them. It was as he was drunkly discussing with his two clever little grots, which mech was currently underworked and needed a new job, or a good kick up the rear end, whilst at the same time fishing about in his pouch for a smoke, that he heard the first distant whine of a jet engine approaching, growing steadily louder and louder. At first, he assumed it would be those mad flyboys testing out their latest fighter-bomber engine, but the single engine had rapidly built into a thunderous din of an airborne armada. Interest peaked. He climbed the nearest scaffolding to get a better view of the aircraft's approach. His cigar was totally forgotten as Buzzgob watched in amazement. All the work around him had stopped as orcs and grots gathered alongside him to gawp. Eighteen aircraft had appeared over the southern horizon, and from them tumbled the tiny figures of Humies. Puny Humies, falling from the sky like rain, or come to think of it, like storm boys, Buzzgob saw. Then, seconds later, heard the violent swoosh of two rockets launched from the lead aircraft. The missiles streaked towards the Gargant, arrow straight and fast, before smashing into the ground ahead of Buzzgob. There was an orange flash, an explosion, and the gantry swayed violently underneath Buzzgob. Thick smoke billowed up, quickly followed by a second blast amidst a pile of discarded parts over which a few grots had been searching all morning. 
jagged metal and the severed body parts of several grots flew into the air and landed close by in a bloody steaming mess. The smell of cordite powder, blood and burned flesh drifted to him. I don't know why they're using cordite powder. That seems a little bit odd. He inhaled deeply. It was a smell he loved. Almost as much as that of old grease, oil and exhaust fumes. It was a smell all orcs loved. Buzzgob grinned. It was the smell of battle. Maybe. Maybe a couple of hundred years ago. The Elysian drop troops had made first contact. The incoming fire was not yet intense, but guardsman Wyatt Oric heard the snap of rounds as they zipped overhead. Wildly inaccurate, but then he had fought orcs before, and wildly inaccurate is what you'd come to expect. It was up close. You didn't want to meet one, face to face. He crawled further up the pile of twisted rubble that had once been a wall of some kind, his Akatrian Mark IV sniper rifle in front of him and his head down. Once he reached a vantage point, he stopped, flipped down the weapon's bipod, and settled into a good firing position. Somewhere out there amidst the junkyard lying before him, there was at least one enemy. He removed the dust cover from the lens of his scope and peered down it, slowly and methodically searching. More rounds fizzed past, not close enough to bother him. He didn't think the orcs knew where he was, they were probably just shooting for the hell of it. Oric watched and waited, patient as the hunter. From his elevated position, he had a good overview. He saw movement to his left and zeroed in. In his sight, he saw a greenskin, small and childlike. It reminded Oric of a Chthonian swamp toad, the way it hopped about from one foot to another, dodging back and forth. It was armed with a pistol, crude and by the looks of it, barely functional. The pistol flashed again, and a bullet ricocheted around, winding off the scrap piles harmlessly. Oric coolly waited, motionless. Next time it hopped out, Oric fired first. The laser blast fizzed briefly, a white streak, and the Gretchen's head seemed to explode. The remaining torso fell hard, flailing. Moments later, a second little greenskin appeared, and Oric dropped it too with another clean headshot, its body landing next to the other. A third Gretchen broke cover and ran, its weapon discarded. As Oric placed his sight reticule upon the back of its skull, a flurry of lasbots flashed from his right, and the creature vanished from sight as it fell. He clipped open his comms mic. This is Alpha 4-4. We have contact front. Three enemies down, holding position. Captain Zeist, sir. Alpha 4-4 report enemy contact at their position. The comms operator updated the captain as he strode amongst the junkyard, standing tall like an officer must. The first shots had been fired. It wasn't important. Just the briefest of firefights with stray Gretchen, not organized resistance. Get me an ETA for the second wave, he demanded of his voxman, who quickly set to flicking switches and dials to find the required comms channel. Exist's first wave was in place. Everything was up and running in minutes. His long-range ground scanner units had nothing to report so far, no major enemy movement, but he still needed to get moving north. Second wave inbound. ETA over drop zone 90 seconds, sir. Exist turned to look backwards. Any minute now, a flight of Valkyries and supporting Vendetta and Vulture gunships would come rushing into view. He pulled his heavy jump helmet off to better hear the approaching engines. He did not have long to wait. Proceeded by the thunder of engines, the Valkyries soon came racing overhead, drop troopers tumbling out in their wake. Amidst the drop troops came sentinels, each mounted upon a heavy grav sled that ejected it out of the rear ramp. Each of the walkers also mounted a large grav chute unit on its rear, and as it fell, the sentinel righted itself before impacting the ground upon its reinforced leg pistons in a cloud of dust and debris. From that dust cloud, the walker reared up to its full height and stalked forwards, weapons swivelling. They were gawky, awkward-looking machines of war, lightly armoured with a single pilot hidden inside the cockpit's roll cage, but each carried a heavy weapon. Their weapons provided the infantry platoons with the sort of heavy firepower mere men just could not carry into battle. More men and equipment followed. Transport after transport sped above them, 
scattering their cargoes of guardsmen and drop canisters before banking away sharply for home. The vultures remained on station, circling high, ready for a call into an attack run. Over the Vox, reports from platoon and sentinel squadrons were coming in thick and fast now. Captain Excised gave his command squad, all squatting close by and in cover, the word to prepare to move out. Then he issued the order for all platoons to begin the advance north towards the Gargant. The mech boss sent Nit Knuckle and Lunk, running to summon all the boys they could. With Buzz Gob's orders to get the dread still ringing in their large pointy ears. As the two grots deftly slid down the gantry ladder, Buzz Gob roared more orders to anybody with an earshot. Get your gear, get moving, he bellowed, waving in the direction of the incoming aircraft and the Humies. All around him, gawping orcs were suddenly running, grabbing anything they could use as weapons. There was going to be a fight, a proper big fight, and there was an almighty scramble to be first to the battle. Buzzgob himself set about grabbing and flinging any orc or grot within reach in the direction he wanted them to run, heedless of the fact that he was stood three stories up on a scaffold gantry. Below him, the bosses and mechs were gathering the boys. From within the Gargan's belly, a group of burner boys appeared, their cutting tools still glowing red hot from the working within. They looked bemused, not having yet registered that they were under attack. A mech ran up and quickly appraised them of the situation. The homies had landed over there! The burner boys needed no second invitation. Hefting their big cutters, they set off running south. Amidst the clamour, truck engines fired into life and boys and grots leapt aboard before racing off, weaving through the scrap piles. Guardsman Oric watched through his powerful scope as the Elysian troops moved out, advancing in good order through the ruins. He thumbed the scope's power to full and scanned the distant horizon. After his first kills, he had changed position as trained. Now he had climbed to the top of the tallest scrap pile around and carefully dug himself in. From here, he could cover the whole sector with accurate sniper fire. If any greenskin poked its head out, Oric was waiting to shoot it off. From his new vantage point, Oric saw a band of orcs approaching in a wide-tracked vehicle. It was some form of truck, all spluttering engine, rumbling tracks and big exhausts. It seemed to have little suspension, and by the way, its passengers were clinging on for grim life as it bucked and bounced over the uneven ground. He counted about ten other orcs and a driver with a variety of weapons. Some seemed to just be carrying pieces of pipe as clubs. He took careful aim on the driver, trying to track its erratic movements. He squeezed the trigger. A single las shot flashed but only impacted on the front of the bouncing truck, scorching the metal but doing no serious damage. He aimed again and fired. This time the shot missed the orc driver's head by inches and again did no damage. As the track ground to a halt, the orcs piled out, running. The driver ducked low in his cab and began to turn around. More of Oric's shots fizzed into the vehicle, but the truck accelerated away. At that moment, a vulture gunship slid overhead and opened fire with its two large Punisher cannons. The gathling cannons sounded like the tearing of heavy fabric. All around the truck, the ground erupted, great chunks of metal flew up, from a cloud of dancing sparks. When the Punisher cannons stopped, the truck was a wreck, track links and road wheels torn off, its engines steaming. The driver was nowhere to be seen. Neither he had jumped clear or been caught in the hail of bullets and had disintegrated. The presence of the gunships loitering overhead gave Oric and his Legion compatriots great heart. Many had fought orcs before and knew that they were an alien race that lived for battle. Yes, they lacked discipline, training and battlefield tactics, but they made up for it with all the aggression and seemingly thick-skulled belief in their own invincibility. In close combat, the Elysians knew that an orc could easily pull their arms off and would grin whilst doing it. They were sadistic, brutal and merciless creatures. But with the vultures, valkyries and vendettas overhead, it was unlikely the usual mob-handed rush of a green-skinned horde would get anywhere near their leading squads. As Oric continued his vigilant overwatch, he could see more orcs massing to the north. At this range it looked like thousands, but it was more likely to be hundreds, and many of them would be uh, the little Gretchen. 
which were about as dangerous as an armed child. As yet, he couldn't see any larger war machines, and that was a blessing from the Emperor. If he did, his comms channel was ready to call down a missile-armed vulture to blast it back into the scrap it was no doubt constructed from. When Tafrak emerged from the bowels of the Gargant, his burner still glowing, red hot from dissecting steel plating, he was bemused, even more so than usual. Protected inside his heavy helmet and face mask, he hadn't noticed that work had ceased for the day until just about every other orc had vanished. Eventually he emerged from the smoky darkness inside what would eventually become the Gargan's engine room, blinking into the sunlight. All around, orcs were running about, grabbing weapons and shouting in a frenzy of chaotic activity. He stood and watched for a minute, still none the wiser. Only when old Gorwaz arrived and pointed out that some dumb humies had landed not far away and there was going to be a scrap, did the penny finally drop. Uh, Tufrock laughed. Well, fighting beat working. He immediately started running. The crushing weight of his burner and its fuel packs momentarily forgotten. As he went, he bawled for the other boys to join him. He ran south, through an area they all knew well where parts for the building work had been sorted and stored. Ahead, the sky was infested with aircraft. More aircraft than Tufrook had ever seen in one place. They were all darting about like stinging insects. Uh, Tufrook and his boys tried to keep up with the crowds of orcs and grots now moving in the same direction, but the weight of their tools, soon to become weapons, slowed them down. A big track, loaded down with more whooping boys, raced past. They were just one of many mobs now heading to the fight. Tufrak's boys first encountered the Humies at what had once been a road intersection. But the road was just broken ferrocrete. Now an empty fuel barrels lay scattered everywhere. Some were still leaking green gunk. They started off across the open ground, humping it as fast as they could, when an aircraft appeared and opened fire. The ground erupted as rounds impacted about him. Somehow, by Gork's luck, they missed him, but old Mech Gorwaz was killed, shredded by the hail of big slugs. Tufrak paused to drag Gorwaz's body away and wedged it under a tottering pile of fuel barrels close by. He wanted to come back and strip the old Mech of his gear and pull his teeth out, but if he left his body lying in the open, he knew he'd soon find some thieving death skull had looted the body by the time he got back. He was still repeatedly kicking Gorwaz's body deeper into its hiding place when he saw the first aircraft shot down. The boys cheered wildly as the smoking trail of a rocket curved skywards. It hit the aircraft on its tail boom, close to the engine, and big chunks flew off in the explosion. Then, for a few seconds, the aircraft just hovered unsteadily. First, it pitched sideways as if in slow motion, rolling over as the pilot lost control. It plunged down and crashed close by, crumbling into the ground and throwing up a huge pall of orange dust. The crash brought more cries of joy from the boys, and Tufrak uh, changed direction, heading straight towards the downed aircraft. There was good scrap to be had of it, and he had just the tool for the job. Captain Exeist watched the first vulture gunship go down through his magnocular scanner. He could clearly see where one of its tail booms had been blasted away by an explosion and the aircraft pitched sideways into the ground. It had been lost in the gathering mass of orcs overhead. There was little hope of rescuing the pilot and weapons officer on board. If the Emperor was merciful, they would have been killed in the impact rather than left to the orcs. The battle had started for real. Up ahead, the firing had grown in intensity. The pop of las guns and the bark of heavy bolters was soon joined by the sudden explosive crump of mortar rounds landing. He could hear the Voxcaster behind him now, wedged on the ground, chattering with the reports of squad leaders and platoon commanders as they fought the Orcs. From Exeist's position, the enemy seemed to be shooting from everywhere. Shells whined overhead. A lot was happening at once. The Orcs were arriving in numbers, but his air support was starting to thin out. Overhead, his vulture gunships were running low on fuel and ammunition. They couldn't loiter close by forever. Soon they would have to turn for home. Captain Exeist had known his most powerful weapon couldn't operate indefinitely out here, but the attack plan included a second wave of gunships that should already be inbound. 
Before they started making bombing and strafing runs, the aircraft needed the location of Exeist's forward squads to avoid attacking their own side. It was to this task that Exeist now committed himself. Buzzgob stalked through the Orc ranks, waving and roaring his boys forwards. A missile streaked overhead and exploded just behind him. The hot blast wave washed over him in a torrent of flying debris. Get him! Get him! He urged all the boys around him. The Orc boys were shooting now, the rattle of shooters and sluggers becoming a cacophony, music to his ears. A bomb exploded amidst the scrap to his left, and a thick metal girder was sent flipping end over end by the blast, splattering an unsuspecting grot as it landed. Another bomb landed, and then another. Lobber rounds. Buzzgob nodded his approval. The Humis obviously had some heavy guns. He could do with some himself, he thought. It briefly occurred to Buzzgob to go and fetch the big lugger, his stomper. But it would take too long to round up the crew, and he would have to quit the field, and he'd only just got here. Things were just heating up nicely. Which reminded the old Big Mech, where the hell were Knit Knuckle and Lunk? The little grots had scampered away to fetch more boys and his dreads. They should be back by now. Most likely, they had found a safe hole and crawled into it. Stupid puny grots. Still, he tolerated their cowardice. They'd be difficult to replace if they got themselves killed. To Buzzgob, it seemed all was going well. The boys were getting well stuck in. A good fight had been what they needed. He'd even seen an aircraft get shot down. He made a mental note to tell Lunk to make sure he got first pickings of the scrap from that wreck. The flyboys would pay well for the engine parts. The orcs and the drop troopers had been fully engaged for over an hour now. At first, the aerial firepower of the gunships had raked the massive orcs and held back the tide. Scores of greenskins lay dead amidst the junk and wreckage of the previous battle for Castrel Novum. Under the curtain of heavy fire, the guardsmen had been able to push forwards towards the objective, fighting on the run as they made good ground. The second wave of gunships had also arrived and quickly unloaded their payloads onto the orcs, adding to the devastation and carnage being wrought upon them. But they had also retired from the battle and would not return for several hours. The drop troops now fought without their heaviest fire support, and the battle was turning. Amidst the rubble and scrap, the Elysians fought with just las guns and grenades. Captain Exist had moved his command post forward, temporarily occupying an old bomb crater. Lying prone at the crater's lip, he listened to the Vox chatter. The half-built Gargant was a lot closer now, looming ahead of them, and the Orc resistance had slackened after the first airstrike. From where he was lying, the captain could see at least six Orcs and Gretchen bodies, most missing limbs and heavily burnt, scattered upon the ground. Three sentinels were just beyond them, firing repeatedly, with the dramatic whoosh of superheated air as their multi-melters turned another pile of scrap into pools of steaming liquid slag. Tufrok ran as swiftly as he could around the junkyard. He had been on Mech Slag X for the past five years, earning his teeth carving scrap into useful bits for building trucks, battle wagons and dreads. Before then, he'd seen lots of fighting on Talarax. That's where he'd earned himself the burner and joined a burner boy's mob. This was his first real action since that time, if you didn't include several brawls over squig juice and teeth payments. He moved with the greater mob, darting from scrap pile to scrap pile for cover and trying to get close enough to put his burner to work. He'd already seen his target, a dread-like walking machine that looked like its legs would come off easily. He was back in the fight after being forced to abandon his attempt to grab some good plunder off the crashed aircraft because Big Mech Buzzgob had showed up, claimed the wreck for himself and ordered them all back into the battle. Still, Tufrok relished the fight. The Humies were fighting hard and giving no quarter and their bombers had been busy. Twice, Tufrok had almost been blasted to pieces by bombs. Still, for all their bombs and guns, the Humies weren't very brave or tough. Without all their aircraft, the boys would easily have surrounded them and then killed them all. Probably with their bare hands, just for the fun of it. He made a dash to the cover of the next scrap pile. There was already a crowd of boys behind it, firing blind over the top. The Humies' return fire was fizzing around them. As he ran, one las bolt punched a steaming hole in his left bicep. It bled, but it didn't hurt. 
Next, he rushed to the smouldering wreck of a truck that had been hit earlier. Scrambling under his bulky equipment, Tofrak ducked into cover in another hail of lasfire. He and several of the boys that had followed his lead lay behind the truck and started shooting back. He saw one Hume shot in the head, his helmet flying off and rolling across the ground. He took aim at where he thought the walker would appear next, a narrow gap between a scrap pile and a half-fallen wall, and waited for his chance. The guardsman Oric was in the thick of the fighting, running alongside a sentinel as it stalked forwards, kicking aside a pile of discarded old tyres and the remains, Oric thought, of a rusting vehicle chassis. The orcs infested the area. Every scrap pile and fuel drum could conceal a lurking greenskin. He dropped to his knees, snapped off three rounds, said movement up ahead, then was up and moving again. The sentinel did not pause to fire, and Oric ran to catch up again. Just as he did, the walker exploded in a shower of sparks and yellow flames. Arc bright, a sudden bolt of light had smashed into its right leg, shearing through the pistons and hydraulic cables like a las cannon blast. The sentinel tottered, then fell, pitching sideways as its right leg gave way under it. Oric jumped back as the sentinel's fuel cell ruptured on impact, spilling high-grade Promethium. From behind, Oric could see the pilot, but suspected he'd been knocked unconscious in the fall. He thought about making a dash to rescue him, but the slightest spark would ignite the fuel and turn the stricken walker into an inferno. Instead, Oric found himself some cover and watched the sentinel from there. The first orcs to appear wouldn't get their plunder without a fight. The first orc to appear wasn't an orc at all, but a clanking war machine, ungainly, with arms flailing, its heavy weapon shooting seemingly at random into the air. Or it couldn't miss. The metal monster filled his sights as he scoped in on it. He fired once, saw the laser bolt impact without result, and took a careful second aim on the vision slit. He fired again, then again, both shots fizzing off the Dreadnought's armoured front plate. Then a returning burst of fire sent Oric ducking back into cover. The Dreadnought clanked on towards the fallen Sentinel, which lay silent in an expanding pool of its own fuel. With a roar of rushing air, the Sentinel was engulfed in flames. The spark from the Orc machine must have just ignited it. More Orcs were following the Dreadnought towards Oric now. Reaching into his arm pouch, he pulled out a crack grenade, flipped off the cap, and thumb the detonator button. Breaking cover, he hurled the anti-tank grenade at the orc war machine, then, hoisting his sniper rifle, turned and ran. The grenade detonated with a sharp crack. Oric didn't look back to see what damage it had done. Instead, he found a new position, skidded into the cover, and settled behind his sniper rifle again. The orcs were closing in, and it seemed reinforcements had arrived. Their chanting and wild shooting was getting closer. At last... His dreads had arrived. They'd taken their time, Buzzgob thought, as he pointed them in the right direction. The boys had taken a bit of a pounding, but his two grots had finally got the dreads moving and now they were here, ready to join the battle. Killer cans, death dreads, and even one of his mega dreads came swaying and stomping through the junk and rubble. All along the Elysian front, the advance had now stalled, ground down into a series of bloody skirmishes that were costing men but not gaining any ground. The Elysians had killed a lot of orcs, but there had been a lot to kill, and more were still arriving. Orcs were being ferried into the area by trucks and wagons, and now their dreadnoughts had joined them. Buzzgob's personal retinue of dreadnoughts had not been far from the Gargan site. Most of the mechs that built and maintained the Dreadheads were the same mechs that were now constructing the Gargant. The Dreadnoughts had thick armour, and the Elysians were not well equipped to meet them on the ground. The drop troops relied upon their air support, and for now it was gone. Captain Exeist was urging Colonel Tahoon to send extra airstrikes, but the regiment was now fully committed to its planned attacks, and just about every aircraft was either engaged in delivering shield force to their drop zone or in transit between the battle zone and the airbase. Exist was painfully aware that it was one of the main drawbacks of air power over ground power. Tanks might need fuel and ammunition, but once they were in place, very little was going to move them. Aircraft needed fuel and ammunition too, but they couldn't hold ground. 
Captain Exeist's earlier worries about Orc numbers had now become more serious. The Orcs were still coming, and his platoons were being eaten up. There were far more Orcs defending this Gargant than Sword Force was equipped to deal with. He estimated that they had killed the Orcs at a ratio of maybe 3 or 4 to 1, but he felt as if the initiative on the ground had ebbed away. The Orcs were still being reinforced and were starting to counter-attack. He could stand and fight and maybe hold out until the gunships returned, but even then he wasn't sure he had the manpower left to wrestle the initiative back and get his men moving to that Gargant again. Better, he reasoned with himself, to look to fall back, reorganise and buy some time by giving up some ground. That way he could preserve some of his fighting strength and coordinate a second push, perhaps drawing upon the regiment's emergency reserves when the air transport became available again. Of course, withdrawing wasn't going to sit well with Colonel Tahoon or the Space Marine Captain for that matter, but as the man on the ground, it had to be Exeist's call. He was the officer in command here, in the right place to make the tactical decisions. He knew he couldn't afford to leave it too long either. An orc attack could overrun the sword force, and then any withdrawal would become a pal mal rout rather than an organised retreat. His mind made up, Captain Exeist got back on the Vox to issue the fallback orders to his platoon commanders. It was time to give up the ground they had won and get some space between his squads and the orcs. Sword Force had lost the initiative. Weight of numbers was beginning to tell. For the moment, the Gargant was out of reach. The drop troopers began to withdraw as fast as they could. Some squads remained in place to cover their comrades, but most made a rapid withdrawal over the ground they had just fought to take. It was ground littered with the detritus of battle. Smoking and burning wreckage spilled acrid black smoke. A small lake formed by the oil slick from a leaking storage tank was burning fierce orange flames that roared 20 feet high, casting a dense cloud into the sky. The dead, human and orc, littered the ground, their equipment lying around them. Many of the lesions were assisting their wounded comrades as they fell back. Squad sergeants tried to maintain order, barking commands to stick together. Nobody was to discard any weaponry. This fight may be over, but they were just regrouping for a second attack. Captain Exeist himself remained in position, watching the men trailing past him, dirty and weary. He'd seen battle many times before, made retreats before, and knew that he had to remain visible, had to let the men see his confidence if the withdrawal wasn't to become a rout and a defeat. He hadn't lost this battle yet. Just then, out of nowhere and with no warning, a mortar round landed, impacting no more than two metres from the officer. The blast lifted him clean off his feet, a smoking chunk of shrapnel smashed into the side of his knee. His armoured knee pad saved his leg from being cut or clean off, but the metal had sliced deep through the flesh and bone. Small pieces of shrapnel had also peppered his right side. One piece had smashed his front teeth out, and blood was leaking down his chin. Dazed and bleeding on the ground, Exeist tried to suppress the howl of pain that was building inside him. His knee felt like it was on fire from the inside. Instinctively, he tried to stand, but fell and cried out in pain. The captain's Vox operator was first to him, arriving as another mortar round landed and sprayed them both with more red dirt. Under fire, he jabbed an ampule of pain-killing chemicals into the captain's neck. It took mere seconds to work and meant he could help the captain up without him passing out. The Vox operator yelled for the medic. The command squad's medic had been a busy man all day, scampering to and fro, his medipack all but exhausted of supplies. When he arrived on the scene, there was little more he could do for his commander. The knee wound was bad. It needed surgery to remove the hunk of metal. It might cost him the leg after all. He helped the Vox operator carry Exeist, and they started moving back. The captain was out of action. Sword Force had lost its commander on the ground. Buzzgob wondered where all the Humies had gone. The fighting seemed to have died down, just as his dreads had arrived and started to get in on the action. One minute there was lots of Dacker flying, now it seemed the Humies had run off, which was disappointing because he'd been hoping to watch the dreads do some serious mangling. He walked over to inspect the charred wreckage of one of the Humies' funny little walker dread machines. It was just a blackened hulk with nothing worth salvaging left behind. The pilot was a hunk of shrunken charred flesh. Buzzgob 
and gave the machine a solid kick, just to see, and his heavy boot made a big dent in the heat-softened metal. Useless junk. Buzzgob marched on, stepping over and on the bodies of the dead as he went. Most of his boys and dreads had raced on ahead of him, still in hot pursuit. Some malingerers were lurking back here, looting. Notably, most had the blue war paint of the Death Skulls. He suspected that most had shirked the real fighting and had just hung around to get the best pickings at the end. Grots were also scurrying about, gathering up armfuls of weapons and gear. It was then that Nip Knuckle and Lunk reappeared, again suspiciously after the shooting had ended. The two Grots came running up with expressions of urgency. Boss! Boss! There is more Humies north of here! Nip Knuckle blurted. Lots more! And Skulks rounded up his boys for the fight! Lunk confirmed eagerly. More Humies meant more fighting. That made Buzzgob pause for thought. The battle wasn't over then. If wily old Skalk was going to fight then, there must be some seriously good looting to be done. Buzzgob stomped off after his boys. He needed to get them moving north. Now. Sword Force's initial assault upon the Gargant landing zone had started well. The Elysians had arrived at their drop zones and began their advance. Initial progress was soon slowed as opposition grew. It seemed there were many more orcs in the area than had been anticipated, and this included unusually large numbers of dreadnoughts. Buzzgob's absolute, unquestionable authority meant the orcs reacted quickly to the surprise attack. They were ready for a fight and gleefully raced to the battle. The Elysians' air power was soon inflicting heavy losses, but not enough to halt the tide of greenskins that was amassing. Driven on by Buzzgob, and with the air cover forced to retire to base to rearm and refuel, the orcs pressed their attack. Overwhelmed by numbers, Captain Exist was forced to withdraw. His assault had failed. It was during that withdrawal that he was critically injured. The failure of Sword Force was to be the first in a series of events that turned the Elysian surprise attack into a bloody battle for survival. The Elysians had disturbed a hornet's nest and rapidly found themselves facing vast numbers of orcs, all well-equipped and battle-frenzied. The Gargant objective was never reached, and despite a quickly improvised plan for the Imperial Navy's marauders to bomb it, only superficial damage was inflicted. Chapter 3. Drop Zone G Landing. Patrolling the Northern Flank. The Taurus all-terrain vehicle swayed violently as it was lowered to the ground. Dust and debris flew about wildly as the Valkyrie's jet wash hammered the ground, turning it into a whirlwind of dust and grit that browned out the ground below. Captain Garrick braced himself against the shock of landing. With a jerk, the magnetic clamps that held the Taurus released and the vehicle plunged, maybe only three metres, to smash into the ground. The vehicle's big suspension coils took the force of the impact as Garrick and his driver, Trooper Ardo, were held tight by their harnesses. Captain Garrick activated his helmet communicator in a burst of static. Clear, he instructed the Valkyrie pilot, still hovering somewhere in the swirling dust maelstrom above them. The Valkyrie's engine note changed, its twin thrusters kicking in as the Sky Talon uh, climbed away from the drop zone. Trooper Ardo powered up the Taurus, its multiple battery packs humming into life. Gradually, the brownout cleared. Garrick unclipped his restraining harness and rose from his rear seat behind the driver. About him, other vehicles were being landed. Each swung below its own transport aircraft. Looking further back, he could see more Sky Talons approaching, each with a Taurus slung underneath. Dagger Force was on the ground. Captain Garrick's Dagger Force was composed mainly of the 181st Regiment's A Company, equipped with Taurus and Taurus Venator rapid pursuit vehicles. They were the regiment's Ford reconnaissance unit, able to cover great distances at speed and operate without support far from the regiment's main body. Their standard mission profile was to find the enemy and report. Today was not a standard mission. Garrick and his men were acting as the regiment's flank protection, whilst the shield force was landing and positioning itself 
for what would be the decisive battle of the raid, Daggerforce was to protect their vulnerable right flank. The planners knew more orcs were north of the battle zone, and it was likely they would respond quickly to the attack. Without Daggerforce blocking the way, any of those orcs could easily outflank shield force and attack it from the rear. Captain Garrick and his men were to set up patrols and a skirmish screen to ambush and delay any orcs that tried to move south. His force had a large area to cover, hence the need for the fast vehicles. Each squadron had been designated its own patrol sector, and they would be supported by a detachment of drop sentinels and a few infantry platoons for extra firepower. Garrick himself would oversee the operation from his command vehicle and remain in reserve with his rapid response force. This was a unit held back, ready to move in and quickly intercept any enemy moves that the patrols couldn't deal with. He also had a flight of free Vendetta gunships on station overhead for when the fighting got heavy. Sergeant Leto's number 6 squadron formed up into line abreast, the free Taurus Venators about 30 metres apart. The ground ahead was relatively flat, but scattered with debris and rusting junk, old tyres, barrels and unidentifiable scrap. In places, crumbling power pylons still stood or lolled over on the verge of collapse. The advancing all-terrain vehicles took it all easily, rumbling steadily over the debris as each driver carefully guided it around the larger junk. Behind the driver, each turret gunner scanned the horizon ahead for signs of the enemy. From his gunner's rear seat in the central vehicle, Leto watched. Briefly, he thought he had seen movement ahead. Alerted, he settled behind the turret's sights and got ready. Up ahead, maybe 400 metres away, there was a low pile of scrap where a power pylon had fallen, but it was big enough to hide an ambusher. The Taurus rolled towards it. Then it was again. Leto could swear he saw it. Movement. Whatever it was, it was small and agile. Six Squadron, hold position, he ordered, and the free Tauros rolled to a halt in line. Through his sight reticule, Leto saw his target, a little green creature, maybe a metre tall. It was armed with a sidearm of some sort, a Gretchen, and it was unlikely to be alone. Enemy contact front, 400 yards, all stations, weapons free. He passed on the instruction and then opened fire. The twin multi-lasers blazed a trail of bright bolts, blasting gaping holes in the metal scrap. The second Taurus joined in, shooting up the pile of scrap. The third Tauros laid on its LAS cannon and fired. The powerful bolt smashed into the scrap, sending debris high into the air. Something in the pile started to burn fiercely. Outgunned, the Gretchen broke cover and ran. There was a group of about ten of the little creatures, fleeing away as fast as their spindly legs could carry them. Leto adjusted his fire, then sent a long burst fizzing through the mob. Two or three fell dead. One was set alight, its ragged clothing burning. The others kept on fleeing through repeated bursts of laser fire, then vanished from sight. Cease fire! ordered Leto, satisfied that the enemy had been neutralised. It was their first contact, but it hadn't been much of a fight. In at least proved the orcs were here. The Gretchen had been scavenging and were unlucky enough to be in the path of Leto's squadron. The sergeant ordered his patrol to move on before adjusting the vehicle's communicator and reporting the brief skirmish to Captain Garrick. It was difficult to actually see the orcs, although not hard to see where they were. Captain Garrick had been tracking the approaching band for ten minutes by the growing dust cloud and the black smoke trails. Even at maximum magnification, his scanner could not make out much. An occasional glimpse of an orc mounted upon a bike or a four-wheel buggy, bucking wildly as it closed on his position. Even as he watched, the orcs were approaching fast. He estimated there were maybe twenty or thirty of them at most. Suddenly, rounds whizzed overhead. Garrick couldn't believe they had opened fire. It was terrifyingly foolish. The fire was wildly inaccurate, but the orcs seemed to just fire for the hell of it. The captain watched with bewilderment. The enemy's ammunition expenditure must be unsustainable. Even orcs couldn't keep up the pointless shooting for long. Garrick's men had orders to hold their fire until the enemy was closer. There was no point in wasting ammunition at this range. As a company that operated so far from their own lines, Garrick's men were all well practiced in strict fire discipline. 
and despite the lack of return fire, Garrick was not simply waiting to be attacked. He had already called up the Vendetta flight. The three gunships had confirmed their coordinates and were inbound, weapons primed, missile racks full. The growl of jet engines grew louder and louder. Then, arriving in a screaming torrent of noise, the three gunships swept in low over Garrick's position, drowning out the sound of the approaching orc engines and the fizz of their wasted bullets flying by. After their initial burst of over-enthusiasm, the orcs' fire had slackened. Now it was the Elysians' turn to respond. The three vendettas had locked on to Garrick's target point, and the captain watched as the wing-mounted missile clusters fell away, briefly racing to the ground. The blast and percussion of the fireball explosions rushed over him, the heat stinging his face. Incendiary yellow and orange explosions mushroomed about the orcs, one after another, burning intensely, then fading into a shrouding cloud of brown dust. The vendettas, their payloads empty, steeply climbed away and vanished into the distant sky. Garrick waited as the dust clouds slowly dissipated, where once there had been the on-rushing orc bikers and buggies, there was now just heat-blackened earth. He couldn't see a single orc left. Their firing had stopped altogether. The Vendettas had scored a direct hit. He ordered one Tauros to scout forwards and investigate the remaining wreckage, whilst the rest of that squadron was to cover the move. From his vantage point, it looked at Garrick like the orcs had been obliterated by the missile strikes. Such a fierce demonstration of firepower might teach these reckless creatures a measure of caution. Caution, however, was not a word war boss Zard Snark had ever encountered. It was not in his nature or his blood. Attack. That was Zard Snark's only order, and he always led the way. He had seen the Humi's aircraft far to the south, hundreds of them darting around in the sky. Humi's that had fallen from the sky like a gift from Mork. It meant one thing. A fight. The war boss set out rounding up as many of his boys as he could, sending bikers racing in all directions to gather them to him. Ognaz's biker mob were closest to the landings, so they should go first and find out what was happening, then come back and let him know. Meanwhile, he would gather every biker boy and buggy, every truck and every grot he could. When Ognaz got back, he'd know if he needed more boys or if he had enough to attack immediately. Patience was another word Zard Snark had never encountered, and even if he'd known it, he didn't have much. With growing frustration, Zard Snark waited and waited, but Ognaz never came back. He was only supposed to go and take a quick look, then come back, but judging by the distant explosions, the smoking wreckage, and the three Humi bombers now climbing away high into the sky, Ognaz had gone and got himself blown up. Perhaps, he thought, he should have sent someone else. After all, Ognaz didn't have the brains of a squig. Despite Ognaz's messy demise, the prospect of imminent battle gladdened Zard Snark's heart. Around him, more of the boys were arriving. Bikes, buggies, war tracks and trucks. All came racing to his call with more boys clinging to every handhold and grab rail. Shooters and choppers in hand. Judging by the numbers, it was time to smash some Humies. Grinning, Zardsnark climbed aboard his huge tracked trike, the Beast. It was larger than most of the buggies and had a jet engine welded to the back. That engine currently sat silent, slowly dripping oil and fuel into an expanding puddle. He quickly checked the bike's ammo drums were full and then hoisted his huge weight onto the starter pedal. The engine roared into life as Zardsnark twisted the throttle hard, the engine screaming in response, straining against its brakes. For effect, he pounded on the throttle, revving and revving. The noise of it got his blood pumping, and from behind him the boys cheered their war boss and answered with their own revving engines. A plume of dirty grey fumes enshrouded them. Zardsnark stood in his saddle, waved the mob forwards and let go of the brakes. The beast leapt forward violently, kicking into the air before smashing back to the ground, the twin tracks biting and throwing out great clouds of earth and grit stones like bullets. The trike accelerated at breakneck speed, 
bucking wildly from side to side. Massively strong, Zard Snark controlled the beast with ease, with just one hand. Roar! He bellowed into the skies, his war cry drowned out by the thunderous din of the engines just behind him as his boys raced to keep up. Zard Snark's biker boys headed south towards battle, and the world would turn black beneath their treads. The Elysians soon realised the first doomed approach had just been a probe, a testing of strength. Now the main body of the Evil Sun's warband was coming, and their numbers darkened the horizon with dust and fumes. The air thrummed with the cacophony of engine noise, like a black thunderstorm approaching. The Elysians readied their guns. Most of the tourist vehicles were dug in behind cover, with only their turrets protruding. Others waited just behind, ready for the order to rush forwards and meet the orcs in the open to break up their mobs before they could reach the Elysian lines. To Captain Garrick, the expenditure of his air support so early seemed like a folly, but he had not been able to know that there were so many more orcs to follow. The display of aerial firepower had been formidable, but not enough to put the orcs off from another headlong charge. Sergeant Leto's sixth squadron had been recalled from their patrol sweep, they had seen the bright explosions in the distance and knew there must be action, but it seemed now the enemy were approaching in strength and Captain Garrick had gathered his furthest ranging patrols to support the main line. The Tauros's low hum became a high-pitched electronic whine as they turned around and bounced back the way they had come, swerving and dodging as they went. Since shooting up the Gretchen scavengers, Leto had not seen anything of the enemy, but now he could see their approaching dust trails, hundreds of them. Taking the lead, he directed his squadron by the fastest route back, a straight line into the thick of the fighting. As the Taurus barreled along, suddenly gunfire erupted all around. A shot cracked off the multi-laser turret, just centimetres from Leto's head. The comms channel screamed, enemy right, and Leto swung the turret hard to face five orcs on bikes that were closing in, then letting fly with their big cannons. The orc rounds zinged and popped as they flew close by. Leto returned fire with a furious fusillade of laser bolts. The Taurus Venator under him was travelling flat out over rough ground and his shots flew wild. Leto's second vehicle was taking the brunt of the attack. Two of its rear tyres had been shredded and it wasn't returning fire. Leto suspected the gunner had been hit. The third vehicle was further behind still, swerving through the wreckage as the war bike swooped ever closer. The closest orc biker hurled a crude grenade, some form of explosive warhead, on a short stick. Leto could see it as it arced through the air, bounced twice, then exploded in a dirty grey puff of smoke. The force buffeted his Taurus, but did no more. He tried to lay his sights on the enemy grenade thrower, but both vehicles were moving too fast, and his burst of fire missed again. Dodging, the orc biker swerved away. Hard right! Leto yelled into the calm and his driver responded, swinging the buggy into a wild skidding right turn, straight into the path of the orcs. From nowhere, an orc rocket skipped across the side panel of the Taurus with a shriek of metal on metal. Leto expected the warhead to detonate and turn his buggy into a fireball, but it didn't. It just whizzed past, flying off to land behind him, lost in the junk. A dud. His driver aimed directly at an oncoming orc, trying to ram him. The biker was agile, however, and swerved his bike round at the last second. But at this speed, the rider lost control, and Leto saw him smash headfirst into a scrap pile and be ejected over his handlebars. The bike lay smoking, its wheels spinning uselessly. As fast as they had struck, the war bikers were gone. Leto scanned a full 360 in his turret, but could see no more targets. His second vehicle had come to a halt further back, its driver and gunner both riddled with bullet holes. The cab was daubed in blood. The third of six squadrons vehicles arrived, reporting one enemy destroyed by its last cannon. He could see the combat damage on the outside of the Tauros. The dents and scrapes of bullet impacts were all superficial. Cover me, he ordered its gunner, before releasing himself from his harness and climbing down from his own turret. He ran back to check the wreckage and confirm the crew of the wrecked vehicle were indeed dead. They were. Not willing to leave the Taurus's plunder for the orcs, 
Leto fetched a melter charge from his own stowage, set the fuse and dropped it into the stricken Taurus. As the two remaining vehicles of Six Squadron moved out again, the charge detonated in a white-hot shower of sparks, leaving the Taurus a burned, twisted hulk. At Captain Garrick's main line, the Orcs were attacking in force. Bikes and buggies swirled round in a thickening gloom of dust and choking fumes. The battlefield was littered with wreckage, but his own lines had held. Just. He'd lost a lot of men and equipment in the fight. Already 19 Tauros had been destroyed. The Orcs had paid him blood too, but heavy losses just didn't seem to worry them. For now, there was a lull in the shooting. The Orcs had sped away, no doubt to regroup or to find somewhere else to attack. Gerek's own Tauros was tracking them, using data relayed from ground scanners he had positioned on first landing. He redirected three squadrons to shadow the Orcs, whilst he pulled the others together and processed damage reports. The fighting here had been heavier than expected. The Orc bikers had arrived swiftly, but Daggerforce had done its job. If this squadron hadn't intercepted these bikers, then by now they would have been tearing into the rear of Shield Force's position in the south. Still, Garrick was concerned. His was a light scouting force designed for hit-and-run actions. Instead, they had been slugging it out with the Orcs, and the attrition was starting to tell. His force wouldn't stand up to much more of this rough treatment. In order to conserve it, he decided to pull back. He would withdraw by bounds, one squadron covering the other as the all-terrain vehicles and sentinels retreated to give them breathing room and open ground between him and the enemy. It was open ground into which he could request more air support. From his comms report, Shield Force were now engaging in a large fight with more Orcs, so he assumed Sword Force had done its job, although he had received no official confirmation of that from the Colonel. Despite his losses, the mission seemed to be progressing as planned. Zardsnark heaved a massive kick into the beast, which sat mutely, jet engine still gently steaming. The trike's front forks had been sheared off by a laser blast. The beast's front wheel was lying somewhere close by, and Zardsnark was furious. Not only was his prized trike damaged, but he'd only just reached the battle when he'd been ejected from his roaring steed by the catastrophic damage. The boys had raced on without him, and most of the battle had passed him by. He walked back to investigate his only victim, a skinny walker machine that De Ripper, the huge buzz blade Zardsnak wielded in battle, had sliced its leg off. The vehicle had toppled over, which had made Zardsnak laugh, only for his manic laughter to be cut short as his bike suddenly detached from its front wheel and it became airborne as the vehicle flipped over. His pride might be hurt, but not much else. No Orc Warboss liked the indignity of finding himself sprawling headfirst in the dirt. Zardsnark pulled out his slugger pistol and emptied the clip into the wreckage of the Humi Walker in frustration. It didn't help. Then he stomped off to find a mech. He wanted that trike running again, now. Having halted the Evil Sun's biker warband, Daggerforce had completed its primary mission. By their actions, Captain Garrick's men had prevented the Orcs from surrounding Shield Force. When the battle at Shield Force's drop zone turned against the Elysians, Dagger Force received new orders to break contact with the Orcs and rendezvous with Shield Force at a new location. Captain Garrick ordered all units to disengage and escape from the Orcs, then to meet up at the rendezvous point for a last stand and hopefully an evacuation. Each squad and squadron had to make its own way. The Orc bikers gleefully gave pursuit and there was a running fight as Dagger Force withdrew in a pal-mal chase through the scrap and wreckage. Captain Garrick's Taurus were the first to reach the rendezvous point. It was the remains of an old refinery, and then they quickly set up a new defensive perimeter. As darkness fell, so the battle-weary stragglers from Shield Force began to arrive, squad by squad, platoon by platoon. Upon arrival, each squad was given a new position to hold, and by dawn's light... Most of the survivors were in place, awaiting the inevitable Orc Dawn assault. Chapter 4. Drop Zone T. Shield Forces Battle. Drop Trooper Yano splashed through a large puddle of oily slime that stained his fatigued trousers black before sliding into position behind a barricade. The cover had been hastily built of tyres, scrap metal and the drop canisters in which the heavy bolter team's weapons had landed. 
It wasn't a fortress wall by any means, but it provided Yano and his loader a good measure of protection. He hefted the bulk of his heavy bolter onto the top of the barricade, which creaked under the weapon's weight, then lined up the sights. Com chatter reports were that the orcs were closing in. Yano was expecting contact at any moment. His loader, Trooper Aganis, threaded the ammunition belt into the weapon and piled several more ammunition boxes close by. Yano hauled the heavy bolter to his shoulder and took aim, bracing himself for the weapon's violent recoil. He scanned the skyline for the first sign of the enemy. Shield Force was now in position. The drop had gone well, and Yano and the rest of his squad had gathered the drop canisters with their weapons and extra ammunition inside before moving into their designated position. As yet, they hadn't seen any orcs, but the distant rumble of explosions and roar of jet engines told them all that the battle had started, if not for Shield Force, then at least for the main assault by Sword Force. Trooper Yano's job was to hold and reinforce their position, hence the improvised barricade, and wait for the orcs to come. Sword Force would be driving them onto Yano's waiting gun. Captain Thanstad moved swiftly from one position to the next, clambering through the rubble and over the detritus and wreckage. He had left his command squad behind. He moved faster on his own, lightly equipped with just his las gun across his back. He sought out each platoon commander in turn, checked his position and defences, and made sure each squad was well supplied with ammunition and grenades for the coming fight. Since first landing, his men had been preparing their defences and reinforcing, he had expected the orcs to react quickly, but so far there had been no contacts reported. The forward sentinel squadrons had probed westwards, but as yet it seemed the orcs had been drawn to the sounds of the fighting to the south, and this place, his grimy oil-stained junkyard, a come shantytown, seemed deserted. All the more time to prepare for the battle, thought Thanstadt. More Valkyries were already inbound, carrying hundreds of extra canisters of supplies. His only concern was his air support. The Vulture gunship squadrons were on station, ready to strike when the orcs attacked, but their fuel capacity would not allow them to linger close by forever. If the orcs didn't come soon, they would be forced to return to base, leaving Thanstadt without his heaviest firepower. The captain was a veteran of many such battles. He trusted that come the fighting, the air support wouldn't let him down. Shield force was relying upon it, and so the mission was relying on it. When the fighting got heavy, and if the orcs attacked with heavy armour, then it was his best chance of holding this ground. Skalk ordered his boys to fetch Bone Muncher. The battle had already started, and he wasn't about to let all the new loot fall into Grack Racks and Buzzgob's dirty claws. The news had reached him when one of his mobs had skidded to a halt in their truck and excitedly announced that Humies were attacking Buzzgob's Gargant. Scout couldn't care less about the mech boss's gargant, except that Buzzgob paid well for the parts he needed. But Skulk wasn't about to save it. If the machine got destroyed, then they would only make another, and that would require even more parts. There was no rush to battle. Skulk didn't want to get his boys chewed up in the thick of the fighting. He could leave that to Buzzgob's dreads and Grack Rag's goffs. They would no doubt be spoiling for a big scrap. He just wanted to be in at the end, to make sure his boys were present when the loot was up for grabs. There would be the usual horse trading between the bosses and knobs over the best bits, but if he could keep them all busy arguing over that, his boys could be plundering the other stuff to their heart's content. By the time the other bosses realised, half the loot would already have been claimed and spirited away on his own trucks. Possession was, after all, all the law and the others could fight him for the gubbins if they felt like it. But he guessed, after a long fight with the Humies, nobody would be willing to take on Mech Slag X Scrap King and all his boys. Feeling satisfied that his plan was suitably cunning, and that his loot hoard was about to get a lot bigger, Skalk sent his runners to gather his boys to him. He wanted every grot and squig they could find. Meanwhile, he would send out a few boys and grots to check up on where the Humies were before marching into the fight. Enemy, 200 meters, 10 o'clock, blurted Loder Aganis into Yano's helmet communicator. Automatically, Yano swung the heavy bolter left, lined up on the target and pulled the trigger. 
at the bolt that spat fiercely, each miniature missile round igniting as it left the barrel in a whoosh of fire and air, speeding out towards the target. The first rounds uh, flew high, and Yano fought the weapon's ferocious recoil to bring the barrel down onto the target. Through his sight, the target was a big green orc, maybe two metres tall, with long, muscled arms, in which it clutched a massive two-handed axe. It was ugly, all fangs and scar tissue, and then it was gone. A second burst of bolt rounds impacted in a rapid succession of small, bright explosions. The big orc vanished from sight. Either it ducked or it had disintegrated amongst the bolt of shells. Yano can tell. He waited for more movement. There was none, but he let fly a third burst, just for good measure. The comms reports crackled with more enemy contacts. The sound of battle was rising about him. The pop-pop of lasgun fire, the jarring roar, swoosh, bang of heavy bolters, the crump of frag grenades, the first skirmishes of a long day's fighting to come. Amidst the reverberation of guns, rockets and mortars, a new sound distinguished itself above Captain Thanstadt's head. A high screaming howl as a jet engine blasted low overhead, followed by a sudden, immense, earthquaking series of explosions that sent Thanstad staggering. Then a second almighty concussion wave swept over him, forcing him to the ground. Bombs impacting, and very close, too close for his liking. He pulled a yellow smoke grenade from his pouch and armed it, before rolling it forwards of his position just a few yards away. It fizzled as thick, ochre, raw-smelling smoke billowed out. The smoke would mark his position for the airport, a precaution against another attack run aimed too close for comfort. More yellow smoke bombs were bursting into clouds around him as squad sergeants followed his example. Through the rapidly thickening yellow haze, Thanstad surveyed the skies for the next inbound vulture. A large black shape suddenly plunged at him, growing huge in size and suddenly filling the sky. The captain had no time to think. He had assumed all the aircraft in the air over this battle would be his own. But this was no Valkyrie or Vulture, or even a Thunderbolt. The aircraft careened wildly, leaving a black smoke trail behind it. And at first, Thanstad thought it had been hit and was going to crash right into them until, at the last second, the aircraft bucked upwards, its shark-like nose rising, and something detached itself from the aircraft's wings. Enemy aircraft, he yelled diving for cover, but even before he could get the words out, the orc fighter bomber had flashed over them, a streak of rusty red. A funnel of dense smoke and yellow flame rushed up out of the ground to meet Thanstad, earth mushrooming high into the sky to rain back down over them in a cascade of filth, smoke and jagged iron, spilling in all directions, like the blast of an invisible rocket jet howling above him, smashing him back to the ground again. A piece of shrapnel wedged into his breastplate. Another, the size of a man's hand, whistled just over his shoulder, less than a metre from completely decapitating him. Punch drunk from the bone-jarring blast, Thanstad crawled, then staggered to his feet. The yellow smoke hadn't saved them from friendly fire. It had just attracted the orc pilot to them. A wave of concussion-induced nausea washed over him, making the captain wretch. A drop trooper rushed to his side to support him, assuming he was injured. Miraculously, the captain was not seriously harmed. The disorientation would soon pass, but he ordered that yellow smoke should not be deployed. It just told the orcs where they were. At last, a skulk was ready. Seated high on his swaying throne on top of Bone Muncher, he could clearly see the columns of smoke in the distance where Buzzgob was fighting, and the northern horizon was also smudged with grey. There was something going on up there too. When his scouting boys returned, they'd been shot up. They'd run smack into a big band of Humies to the east, all dug in, just waiting. It occurred to Skalk that if Buzzgold was fighting in the south, then these Humies weren't actually fighting anybody. They were just waiting for what Skalk didn't really know or care, but it seemed to Skalk that it might not be a good idea to just ignore them. These lurking Humies were up to something. He felt it in his bones. He knew sneaking gits when he saw them. He thought hard. The strain etched on his blue face. No. He couldn't risk ignoring them. Instead, he would attack. This would be Skalk's own battlefield. 
He barked an order to his closest knobs to get the boys moving east and barked for the swaying squig-off to veer left. From behind his barricade, Trooper Yano continued to scan his target sector. The first few orcs hadn't put up much of a fight. They seemed to pull back rather than face the guns, which was uncharacteristic of orcs. Still, the first orcs had no doubt gone to fetch help and would soon be back for more. As he waited, out of nowhere, a storm broke about Yano. Thunder rolled from the sky as steel rained down. Every orc must have opened fire. Shells whined and cracked. Lightning flashed as explosions drummed across the front line. Hundreds at once as the orc barrage began. Smoke, cumulus, rolled across the battlefield. Miniature tornadoes burst suddenly, erupting left, right and centre. Yano and his loader were showered in dirt. Once, twice, then a third time, as the air above them fizzed with buzzing shrapnel. Cloying cordite fumes, again with the cordite, lay thick all about as the gunner and loader both hugged the ground. Yano's heavy bolter was tossed from its perch on top of the barricade, clattering to the ground nearby. And suddenly, as it had started, the barrage subsided, the intensity of the explosion slackening. A new noise could be heard. After the deafening cacophony of the bombardment, there was a roar, a cheer, or a battle cry, rolling towards them. Hundreds or thousands of feral voices raised as one. Wah! came the cry, dim at first, but growing louder. Wah! A lot of orcs were coming. Enemy infantry approaching, all stations engage at will. The order crackled through Yano's headset from his command squad. Trooper Yano crawled after his weapon, dragged it back into cover, and began quickly checking it for damage. Beside him, Trooper Aganis poked his head above the barricade and levelled his lasgun, covering Yano as he worked furiously, clearing dirt from the firing mechanism. To the right, another heavy bolter opened fire, hammering out a stream of shells. Mechanism cleared, Yano heaved his heavy bolter back into place and was suddenly confronted by a tidal wave of green aliens. Before him, the ground was packed with orcs racing towards them, all waving axes, swords and guns. Many were covered in blue war paint and tattoos. More and more orcs, hundreds of them, came charging towards the barricades, firing without conscious effort. Momentarily, the heavy bolter's muzzle flash obscured Yano's view. The tiny blips of Tracer chased each other into the approaching horde. Instantly, a succession of mini-explosions blossomed amidst the orcs. More guns were firing from the left and right. Mortar rounds began to land, falling steeply onto the orcs, who advanced in rushes. Each time, more aliens fell as the explosions and heavy bolter fire swept the ground. Yano's own heavy bolter thudded away, its barrel beginning to glow hot. Trooper Aganis slammed home belt after belt of ammunition, each time slapping Yano's leg to alert him that the task was complete. There were a dozen lines of tracer crisscrossing the sector, each siving through the orc ranks. Now the orc charge had become a mass of stumbling, crawling, falling green bodies amidst the maelstrom. Raked by explosions, the orcs hesitated and eventually they ran, falling back before the merciless onslaught of bolts, laser blasts and shells. Janos fired after them as the orcs disappeared from view, back where they had came from, until he could see no more targets. The metal of his weapon's barrel had been stained purple by the intense heat bloom. The cooling metal gave a tortured shriek as it shrank back into shape. Next to Janos, Aganis had dropped down behind the barricade and was furiously counting ammunition. Over half their supplies had been used up. While the orc charge disintegrated, their barrage continued. Scattered plumes of earth, rubble, metal and flame uh, spreading across the junkyard. In places, they started small fires which added to the thickening toxic atmosphere, full of harsh smoke and the stench of burning flesh, the smog of battle. From the front line, Captain Thanstad reviewed the damage reports. The first serious orc attack had been repulsed by the Elysian's potent firepower, but the aliens would be back for more. Already, he could hear the throbbing engines of armoured vehicles approaching. The first infantry wave had been no more than a screen. Next would come the full fury of the orcs. He passed on the order for all units to hold their positions. This fight had just started. His first attack 
had been repulsed. The Humies had some impressive Dacker power, and a lot of Skalk's boys had just been blasted to bits. But there was plenty more where they came from. Skalk wasn't worried. The old war boss would attack again, and this time would bring up his big guns and battle wagons. He'd let the Humies have it with everything he'd got. He would lead the attack himself from Bone Muncher. It was time to find out if this squig off was actually worth all the teeth and good scrap it had cost him. Captain Thanstad saw the huge beast, a great lizard-like creature, at least three stories high, two curling tusks, twice the size of a man protruding before its flattened, pug-nosed face, underneath which glistened rows of sharp fangs the size of swords. Each of its four footfalls made the ground tremor as the beast bellowed in anger. Laser blasts raining off its horny hide, itself protected by swinging plates of metal armor crudely cut and attached by chains. The squig-off rampaged forwards, head lowered to butt, as orcs, men and machines were barged in all directions. Before it, most of the Elysians fled, falling back to find safety rather than be trampled beneath its elephantine feet. He saw one brave drop trooper pause to hurl a crack grenade at the beast, seconds before being tossed high by a flick of the creature's tusk, his torso severed from his legs as he landed in a wet spray of gore. On the creature's back was a hoarder, again crudely cut from scrap metal. In it rode a swaying, cheering, whooping gaggle of blue painted orcs, each firing frantically, bullets spitting in all directions as the squig off left an indiscriminate trail of destruction in its wake. Kneeling, Thanstad levelled his las gun and took careful aim. He engaged the weapon's auxiliary grenade launcher, a narrow tube beneath the las gun's barrel. He lined up his sights on the creature's left eye and fired. In a puff of cordite, cordite again. Cordite isn't used in everything. It's not used in anything anymore, to be honest. At all, no weapons use cordite. I don't, I don't think so. Unless they're like 200 years old. It's like for muskets and shit. I don't know. Ugh! The crack grenade winged its way straight into the creature's head and detonated on impact. The powerful shaped charge was designed to penetrate tank armor, but it could not pierce the creature's thick bone skull. The explosion left a bloody scar streaked across its face and the creature staggered, bellowing in pain now. As it swayed violently, a few of the orcs on top were pitched sideways out of the holder, falling like flailing rag dolls to crumble on the ground. Despite its wounds, the squig-off did not stop. It just charged on like a lumbering, unstoppable express train. Behind it, more of the beasts followed. Trooper Yano saw the beast coming. Last belt, advised Aganis as he pushed the ammunition home, slapping the gunner's leg again. Ready! Trooper Yano was almost out of ammunition. He took aim and stitched a short burst directly into the creature, and then again and again. It loomed massive above him. He couldn't miss. Then, momentarily blinded by an explosion against its skull, the creature lurched towards him. Yano abandoned his heavy bolter and dived clear as its great tusks rammed the barricade, scattering it in all directions. Loda Aganis rolled away, only for the beast's great foreleg to kick out over the remaining barricade and stamp down hard. It was a mercy that Yano could not hear Aganis' death scream over the din of battle around him, but as the squig off marched on, there was nothing left of his loader except a red smear on the ground. Unarmed, with his firing position overrun, Trooper Yanos uh, headed for the rear. It wouldn't be long before this place was swarming with more orcs, and to continue the fight, he needed to find a weapon. The center of his line had broken. The Squigoff's reckless charge had punctured clean through, and more orc vehicles and mobs were now pouring after it. Thanstad gathered what stragglers he could about him, determined to make a fight of it. Even as he gave orders for his left and right flank companies to fall back and regroup, ready to make a second stand. His men had fought hard and bravely, as the Emperor expected, but the orcs had just been too many and too well equipped with heavy weapons and armoured vehicles. They had killed hundreds, maybe thousands of the aliens, but it had not been enough. The tide of this battle had turned against him. Thanstad understood that much. He must salvage what he could and regroup for a fresh stand. Darkness was approaching as the surviving senior officers of S.H.I.E.L.D. Force gathered in the remains of a burnt-out small shack for an orders group. Captain Thanstad 
smoke-blackened and sallow-eyed from battle fatigue, laid out the situation in blunt terms. B Company had been badly mauled by repeated orc onslaughts and was now in full retreat towards the disused refinery site he had chosen as the rally point. C Company to the south had borne the brunt of repeated dreadnought attacks, but had held their ground well until the arrival of an orc stomper. Air support had inflicted serious damage, but had not destroyed the war machine, and that company had also been forced to withdraw. Again, the losses in men and equipment had been great. To the north, most of D Company were still in good fighting order. They had been in combat, but here the orcs had been less numerous and less heavily equipped. However, D Company could not be expected to hold their position. Now the other companies were in retreat, and so were also forced to fall back too. They would be providing the rear guard platoons that would hopefully delay the enemy's pursuit. The news from Sword Force was bad. Their assault had failed to break through to the Gargant and been overwhelmed. Scattered survivors were now being picked up, as and when Colonel Tahoon could organise an airlift for them. Captain Exist had been critically wounded in the fighting. The news from the north was better. Captain Garrick's dagger force had done its job well and screened their northern flank. Thank the Emperor for that, because without them, they would all be surrounded by orcs right now. The survivors of Dagger Force had raced to secure the rendezvous point and were holding it now. Everybody else should make their way to them tonight. There would be no stopping for rest. The more men that could be gathered, the better their chances of survival tomorrow. Each officer gave him a rough head count, and the numbers didn't look encouraging. Over a thousand men had landed in Shield Force. After today, Thanstadt thought he had about 400 left. How many who could get away would depend on how tomorrow went. First they had to regroup and fight off the inevitable orc attacks. If they could see the orcs off, then there was still a chance they might all live to fight again another day. Of the space marines, Thanstadt knew very little. He did know that scout units were still operating in the area, but his authority did not allow him to intervene in their mission. The colonel had assured him that the Raven Guard had not abandoned the Elysians or the mission, and they would be available for the evacuation mission that had been hastily organised for tomorrow. Colonel Tahoon was preparing to commit the regiment's reserve company in a fresh drop at first light. He would lead that reserve company himself. He reassured his officers that although they were retreating, they were still in good shape. They still had enough men and air support to beat the aliens. The orders group complete, Thanstadt wished the Emperor's protection on them all and bid them return to their companies and platoons. He would see them all at dawn for their second stand. Chapter 5 Wings of the Raven Strike Force Corvidae's Assault The reverberations of atmospheric re-entry shook the drop pod fiercely as it sped towards the planet. Inside, Chaplain Etath and his men could not see their target, looming ever larger below them. They were locked into their restraining harnesses. Each of the ten space marines stood bolt upright to attention, unable to move despite their powered armour. The drop pod's descent from the orbital strike cruiser to the landing zone below would take just a few minutes. A few minutes of bone-shaking G-forces that would have crushed any lesser man to death. But these were no mere men. Each was a space marine of the Raven Guard chapter, a genetically adapted super warrior made for battle, loyal only to their emperor and merciless to his enemies. Chaplain Etath felt the drop pod jar violently as it adjusted its descent trajectory. Automated telemetry data was scrolling across his helmet visor, reading directly from the pod's onboard Logis engine. The machine's spirit was directing them into battle, but it was not the machine spirit that was Etaf's concern, it was his battle brothers. He opened his helmet comms channel and repeated the first stanza of the litany of battle to embolden their fighting hearts before disembarking and bringing the bloody retribution of the Emperor's wrath to the foul Xenos that had tainted this world and many others like it across the Forsar sector. As our bodies are armoured within adamantium, our souls are protected with loyalty. As our bolters are charged with death for the Emperor's enemies, our thoughts are charged with vengeance. As our ranks advance, so does our devotion. For are we not space marines? Are we not the chosen of the Emperor? 
His loyal servants unto death. The chaplain's command was a small strike force, uh, made up of just five drop pods, uh, carrying just over 30 battle brothers of the Raven Guard, but each was a match for many times their number. Even this small force would be enough to complete their mission, to destroy the orc's main fuel stockpiles. Their orbital assault and just these few space marines could inflict a crippling blow on the orcs. Brother Oriath uh, crawled slowly forwards, under the abandoned remains of a destroyed vehicle. It might once have been a Chimera armoured troop transport, but now most of the vehicle had been looted, leaving just the rusting cased metal bones of the chassis. The scout's chameleon cloak adjusted to his cover's colouring, and its camouflage changed accordingly. Hidden by the cloak's chameleon-like qualities, the scout was all but invisible as he lay still watching. He was tracking orcs, no more than a hundred meters away, large mobs of the rowdy green aliens were tramping northwards, each carrying large weapons and draped in a lot of ammunition. Several smaller Gretchen mobs were trailing behind, struggling with larger ammunition crates. Beyond the green-skinned mob was a group of five dreadnoughts, ramshackle walkers that swayed and staggered, arms waving wildly. To the scout, they seemed on the brink of pitching over, but always seemed to right themselves. A brother Orath had been silently watching for several hours. Many orcs had been travelling along this worn route, heading northwards. The fighting that had been raging to the south had died down. For the first time in hours, the air wasn't being buffeted by explosions or the shriek of jet engines and missiles. There was still the occasional distant burst of heavy bolter fire or the crump of a mortar shell landing, but it seemed that the battle was all but done. The orcs were now redeploying, heading northwards in considerable numbers uh, towards Drop Zone T, where more of the Elysian drop troops were in place to meet them. Brother Orof uh, decided he had seen enough. He should rendezvous with the rest of his squad and report in to Captain Corviday. It was obvious that the Elysians at Drop Zone X had been defeated. The assault plan was failing. Now those orcs that had been engaged in the south were moving north to join the battle at Drop Zone T, which meant that the Elysian force there was likely to be overwhelmed as well. The scout slowly slid backwards, his attention never straying from the orcs ahead of him as the unruly aliens marched out of sight, still arguing amongst themselves. During his vigil, he counted over 300 alien warriors, at least 20 dreadnought-sized walkers, some large, some small, and one far larger walker, a stomper. That was just in his designated observation area. The rest of his scattered scout squad would have seen more. The orcs were on the warpath, in strength. Once out of sight, Brother Oriath rose, uh, slung his sniper rifle over his shoulder, and scurried quickly away. He summoned his transport. It was time to regroup. Crouching in cover, he waited until, skimming quietly and low over the ground, came the land speeder. It hovered briefly as he leapt up, gripping the grab rail tight as the speeder accelerated away, still keeping close to the ground to avoid being spotted. The land speeder storm was specially adapted for scouting missions. One by one, it collected the rest of Oriaf's squad from their observation posts. Their reports confirmed his own. The scouts withdrew to safety and flashed their reports back to Captain Corvidai's command vehicle. Ah! Smash! The two big orcs roared as they met at a flat run, forehead to forehead. Both recoiled from the bone-breaking impact of the flying headbutt, uh, staggering slightly. They glared at each other, and then one toppled backwards, smashing to the ground, groaning and then unconscious. Grakrag laughed out loud, his chuckle more of a guttural bellow. He had won again. He was undefeated. The undisputed head-butting champion of Mech Slag X, as well as its top war boss, and the hardest orc for light years around. The unconscious orc at his feet started to moan slightly, uh, groping its head. A crack rag uh, stuck the boot in for good measure. To the victor, the spoils, after all. That's two more teeth you owes me, he reminded his conquered opponent as he crawled away, rubbing his own head. A crack rag stomped away. Was that it? Was that the best entertainment to be found on this dump of a planet? Warboss Grakrag was bored, and that made him mean and angry. 
Winning headbutting contests was all very well, but it was no substitute for a real fight. Maybe he would take a trip out with a few of his boys and find some mangy death skull rats to beat up. Grackrag's violent reverie was interrupted when a small grot, eyes bulging in fear and panting hard, came skittering into the room. Tongue lolling, the grot was about to collapse with exhaustion. Grackrag's two burly minders stepped towards the intruder threateningly, and the grot shrank back. What do you want? demanded Gorag, uh, Grackrag's chief minder, as he reached threateningly for the chopper on his belt. The grot almost passed out with fear. Um, 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 it stammered. Spit it out! I bite your head off, warned Gorag. Yumis! Loads of them! Dropping from the skies! It blurted before sinking to its knees in abeyance. That got Grakrag's attention straight away. He leapt to his feet, still rubbing his bruised forehead. Where? He demanded urgently. Um, um, the messenger squirmed on the floor. Don't kill me, your war boss, this, your magnificent. Shut up! Tell me where! Grakrag could feel his blood rising, the call of battle. At the Gargan! Mech boss Buzzgob's fighting them! There's loads and loads of them, even Skulk's fighting them! Get the boys! Get the wagons! Get everything! he yelled at Gorag. Move! There is fighting to be done! Move! He bellowed into the minder's faces. Both immediately sprang away out of the throne room. Yes! Grakrag roared his excitement. At last, action. The snivelling grot messenger forgotten, Warboss Grakrag strode from the throne room in search of his best armour and biggest shooter. As he did, one large iron-booted foot squashed the prone messenger flat without the Warboss even noticing. As the chaplain-led strike force Itath descended, so Shadow Captain Corviday's own force was circling in a formation of seven Thunderhawk gunships awaiting their target. The captain himself was seated inside his command vehicle, a land raider Prometheus slung on magnetic hooks beneath its Thunderhawk transporter. Brother Captain, the voice of the Thunderhawk's comms officer spoke into his helmet communicator. Continue, instructed Corviday. Scout squad Uriath reports large numbers of orcs moving northwards, including dreadnought support and at least one large war machine. They are reinforcing against drop zone T, no confirmed sighting of our primary target. Relay me all your orgid data for that position. Detail squad Oriev to move south and redeploy to their second sector. The Prometheus's command screen flickered into life. Green runes and icons flashed onto the screen as the Thunderhawk's own sensors swept the ground below and passed the images on. It was impressive information. No replacement for eyes on the ground, but it gave Captain Corviday an overview of what was happening. The sensor sweep was picking up the orc's movements. He keyed in new sector coordinates, and the screens flickered and changed again. The grainy icons and indistinct blobs showed where the Elysians were fighting at Drop Zone T. He keyed again, and his helmet comms adjusted to the Elysian comms channels. He listened in to the faint sounds of their reports and orders. They seemed so far away, like the distant ghosts of an ancient battle. Boost that channel! He ordered the aircraft's comms operator, and the noise suddenly distorted before growing louder. The reports were not positive. The Elysians were heavily engaged and taking losses already. Uh, the reported orc reinforcements might be enough to break them. Corvinet felt frustration rise and push it away. Cool heads were needed. He knew he could be at the Elysian side in minutes, but without a positive identification on his target, he would be sacrificing his own mission. But now the guardsmen would have to struggle on alone. Give me reports on Strike Force Eater, he demanded. Telemetry data from orbit says first wave will be making planetfall in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 2, 1. Now, the bark of bolters surrounded Chaplain Eteth as he advanced, their weapons fire flashing in pre-dawn darkness. Crozius Arcanum held high above his head to show he was at the fore and for his battle brothers to follow. He placed the sight reticule of his auto senses on an orc's face and automatically pulled the trigger of his bolt pistol. Three bolts launched 
and instantly smash the orc's head like an overripe fruit, its green body collapsing as a twitching heap on the ground. The entire target area was a mass of old pipeworks and storage tanks. Most of it looked disused, but it was difficult to tell with the orcs. Fuel barrels lay scattered about everywhere. In places, leaks had pulled into black, oily lakes. The chaplain Eteth could not tell how deep. Behind him, his squads had spread out, deploying from their drop pods as they burst open, bulk guns firing. The first orc guards had been caught by surprise and quickly overwhelmed. Their torn bodies now littered the area. A few of the Gretchen had fled rather than face the implacable, divinely inspired wrath of the Space Marines. Over the comms, the squad sergeants were issuing orders and getting their combat squads into position before the orcs recovered and counterattacked. It did not take them long. More orcs, and mostly in black painted armor, came charging, bellowing their bestial war cries. Eteth emptied his bulk pistol's magazine into them, and then stepped forwards to meet the charge. The first orc he met was a big, dark-skinned brute, its face hidden by an iron-armored jaw, two large animal horns curved from its helmet, a chain axe screamed in its hand. The orc's charge smashed into him, trying to use its size to drive Eteth back, but his armor's servo actuators responded, locking him in place as the orcs tried to push him over. Grappling with each other, the chaplain's enhanced strength forced the orc backwards as he swung down powerfully with his crozius arcanum. The golden wings of the weapon cracked as its energy field smashed into the orc. Its helmet buckled and split, its skull caving in as blood-splattered crozius rose again. Grievously wounded, the orc flailed backwards, the teeth of its chain axe biting deep into Etef's own armour, shards of ceramite and adamantium exploding from the rend. Etef swung again, another clubbing blow that sent the wounded orc boss reeling to its knees. Blood was pouring from its head wound, splashing upon the chaplain's ornately decorated powered armour. Around him more orcs were dying under the chain swords and power swords of his assault brothers. The orc gurgled something in its own guttural language before Eteth placed a power-armoured boot on its forehead and kicked it to the ground. It writhed beneath his foot before he drove the crozies down one last time, delivering the coup de grace. Struggling, the orc died. Chaplain Eteth paused briefly to reload his pistol before moving on, scouring the landing zone of orcs one after another. The second wave of drop pods was landing now, each crashing into the ground in a plume of dust before disgorging more Raven Guard battle brothers. Combat squads, Pygargus and Dorica, begin setting melter charges, he ordered. Meanwhile, in the skies, Shadow Captain Corviday was concerned about the situation on the ground. His strike force had been circling now for hours without any target location. Meanwhile, the battle was raging. All three of the Elysian drop zones were engaged, whilst his elite strike force was idle. It sat ill with the captain that other men should be fighting and dying in the Emperor's cause, whilst his battle brothers sat impotent. Still, he must have patience. Their time would come. Captain Eteth removed his engraved, skull-faced helmet and watched as the first melter charge detonated. First, a sudden bright spark of yellow flashed, then the entire fuel storage tank, a tall structure at least four stories high, exploded. The orc fuel detonated in an expanding orange fireball that raced skywards. He felt the heat wash over him. Then a towering column of black smoke poured out. Soon the dark cloud had blocked out the sky, shrouding the old refinery in a cloying smog. Etath snapped his helmet back into place as the comms channel burst into life. Squadronica reporting, second charge is in place and fused. We are withdrawing before detonation. A second fuel tank was ready for destruction. Elsewhere, Brother Uriath leveled his sniper rifle on a distant grey smudge of dust on the horizon, sighted in and thumbed the magnification to maximum. The smudge rushed towards him in the eyepiece, blurred momentarily, then refocused. He panned the weapon down onto its source. The scout could see, still small, an armoured vehicle, some form of heavy tank with multiple turrets. 
He didn't recognise it, but then again, all these orc vehicles seem to look different anyway. It was black and mounted with horns of some enormous beast across its radiator. Behind it followed more vehicles. He could just about make out each of the crews in the hatches, and clinging to the sides of each vehicle were more orc tank riders bouncing along. The column continued to grow. Three, four, five rickety vehicles, wheels and tracks churning as they all headed north. Another orc warband was approaching. He clicked his communicator open to report his latest sighting. Shadow Captain Corviday was faced with a dilemma. The situation on the ground was deteriorating. Slowly, the Elysian drop troops were being overwhelmed and, whilst offering brave resistance, it seemed that unless they were evacuated, they would be destroyed. He could not sit by and allow this to happen. New reports of more orcs arriving from the south and an armoured column of battle wagons and tanks making its way towards the battle zone at speed left him with a hard choice. He hadn't yet located his main target, and with every passing minute, the mission's importance was being reduced by the situation on the ground. To intervene now might mean abandoning any hope of completing that mission, but the crisis moment of the battle had come. All his instincts told him it was time to act. Corviday worked quickly. The Elysians should disengage and fall back to a new location from where they could set up a new defence, and then a rapid extraction operation would begin. In order for the Elysians to have a chance to regroup, he needed to buy them some time. His strike force would land and place themselves between the Elysians and the newly arrived Orc Armoured Column, fighting a delaying action long enough for the drop troops to pull back and dig in again. Meanwhile, he would dispatch Thunderhawks to recover Chaplain Etef's strike force and redeploy them to aid the Elysians. It was tactical thinking on the fly, but Corvidae needed to be flexible. The battlefield situation was fluid, so rigidly adhering to his old plan was folly. In effect, his new self-imposed mission was now a rescue operation, to save as many Elysian drop troops as he could whilst inflicting as much damage on the Orcs as possible. The Raven Guard captain would use his scouts on the ground to target the Orc column and harass them whilst he deployed his strike force for the ground battle. The only other aid he could call upon was from the strike cruiser. They could begin an orbital bombardment of known Orc concentrations, lending some much-needed heavy firepower to the drop troops' withdrawal. Without further hesitation, he began issuing the necessary orders. Brother Oriath had the Orcs in his sights and was cleared to open fire. It was time for his observe and report mission to end and for the killing to begin. At 400 metres, his sight was filled by each Orc as he panned over the lead vehicle. They were unaware of his presence. The scout took careful aim, selecting the largest of the massive tanks riders. His training taught him to hit the biggest orcs first. They were invariably the leaders. He had waited patiently until the orcs had moved into his best killing range. Carefully, he squeezed off his first round, the silenced barrel of his weapon muffling the sound into an almost polite cough. The bolt flashed, smacked the surprised orc boss in the side of the head, and he tumbled off the side of the vehicle. To Orif's surprise, it wasn't dead. Bleeding, the orc got up again, looking shocked, but seemed to be relatively unharmed. He took aim again at the day's target and fired again. The second blast hit it square in the chest, punching it off its feet. The other orcs were jeering and laughing whilst looking round for the source of the firing. Underneath his chameleon cloak, Orif was just another patch of dirt. His third round finished his target with a clean headshot. His work done, a brother Oriaf crawled away to change his firing position. The other scout snipers took a steady toll on the orcs as they advanced, but they soon learned to keep their heads down and use their vehicles as cover. Still, each dead alien now was one less the Raven Guard battle brothers would have to kill when they arrived. Even as Oriaf and his fellow scouts were working over the armoured column with accurate sniper fire from afar, the Thunderhawks of Strike Force Corviday were placing the assault squads and heavy vehicles directly in the Orcs' line of advance. As the Orcs approached the Raven Guard positions, Oriaf and the other scouts were recalled to join the main battle line and support it with their lethally accurate shooting. Just as darkness was starting to fall across Castrol Novum, the Raven Guard's ground assault began with the blinding flash and monstrous shock of Laz cannon blasts, the rapid bark of Thunderfire cannons, 
Heavy bolters and the impact of the Thunderhawk's Hellstrike missiles all bursting in blooms of red, yellow and orange that bathed the battlefield in fierce, strobing light. The orcs responded with poorly aimed barrages of mortar rounds and rockets that traced arcs of red fire across the deepening purple of the sky. The Raven Guard surged forwards to meet the advancing orcs, shadowy black armoured figures against the twilight. Their intent was to strike the vanguard of the orc reinforcement column hard, destroying it and stalling their advance and buying the hard-pressed legions to the north time to regroup and prepare a new defensive position. The battle had been quickly planned and executed, but each space marine knew his task well. Years of training and experience on battlefields across the segmentum had honed each into a formidable warrior. With meticulous coordination provided by Captain Corvidae's second-in-command from his command post inside his land raider Prometheus, the assault began. The Raven Guard squads crashed through the junkyard, their vehicles in close support just behind, firing over their heads. As was customary, their captain was at the front in the vanguard of the attack. They were moving quickly. A barrage of orc shells fell about them. One impacted directly amongst a combat squad, its blast lacing them with shrapnel and blowing two off their feet. The veteran brother leading the troops reported he had lost two of his men, and without instruction the apothecaries immediately moved to aid the stricken brothers. Leaving the apothecaries behind to deal with the wounded and dying, Shadow Captain Corvidae burst over the top of a scrap pile into plain view of the orcs. An undisciplined mob of greenskins were gathering around their vehicles, the smoke of their heavy weapons fire already enshrouding them. Corvidae saw the closest vehicle's battle cannon fire again. The shell screamed straight at him. Instinctively ducking, it whistled just over his head, hit the ground, skittered across the floor, and came to a standstill before suddenly exploding in a grey plume of dirt. For the Emperor! Attack! Attack! He ordered and powered the jump generator upon his back into life. He sprang forwards, whining turbojets, boosting him through the space between him and the orcs. He aimed directly at the closest greenskin, both power-armoured feet smashing into the alien and driving it to the ground as he landed directly on top of it, before pounding its skull open with a single strike of his thunder hammer. Around him, other assault battle brothers were doing the same, chainswords and power weapons hacking down as they landed amidst the enemy. The orcs fought back savagely in a whirling confused melee of swords and axes. There was no time for reports or tactical planning now, and just a bloody rush of battle at close quarters, kill or be killed. Death was close. Corvidae could feel its grip upon him, but he would not let it take him yet. Not before he had slaughtered these alien fiends in the Emperor's name. In the gathering gloom, Warboss Grackrag leapt down from his idling battle fortress. His boys and knobs were gathered about him, weapons in hand, hungry for some action. Up ahead, the firing had intensified. The big booms of kill cannons and lobbers sounded close. Stray bolt rounds fizzed past. Several ricocheted off the battle fortress's roller and detonated in the air overhead. Determined not to miss out, the war boss strode towards the sound of the guns, shoving aside grots and boys as he went. Trailing behind him were his retinue of knobs and ard boys, his best fighters, tough orcs all. Up ahead, he saw a truck, a big shooter blazing wildly left and right. Suddenly it turned into a bright fireball that cast long shadows across the darkening battlefield. Figures were moving about in the firelight, bulky figures in big suits of armour. Space Marines. Grackrag beamed a wicked fanged grin. Here was some real fight then. The Humies had sent their own hard boys. Come on, lads. Let's have them. Come on. Wah! He broke into a sprint, as did his boys, and ran headlong at the closest Space Marine. It was dark now, but it mattered not to Brother Scout Uriath. His sniper rifle's sight lit the battlefield in a green-tinged light through its lens. He could see clearly the hot spots of Space Marine-powered armour, their subatomic core power packs glowing brightest of all. The orcs were a dull smudge. It was on these that he placed his sight reticule and fired. From his vantage point, he had a good field of fire. More and more orcs were coming. There was no shortage of targets. He fired again and again. 
not pausing to see if each target had been killed. As more orcs arrived, the fighting intensified. More shells shrieked and boomed, more blasts tore about them. The orcs were howling, their guns were hammering and darkness had come. Corvidae knew it was time to withdraw. His attack had been ferocious and he had personally killed 10, 15, 20 aliens. He had lost count in the swirling hand-to-hand -hand combat. His black armour was rent and worn. One shoulder pad had been torn away by a blast, but it had saved his life. Instructing the scout snipers to cover his withdrawal, he ordered all squads to break away from the battle and regroup. Overhead, the Thunderhawks were arriving again to evacuate them. He knew he was leaving the orcs in possession of the battlefield, but his swift assault had torn the heart out of this warband. Battle wagons were burning. The bodies of the dead littered the ground in all directions. He was satisfied that these orcs were no longer the threat to the Elysians they had been. Rumbling out of the darkness, the land raider Prometheus arrived. He could see the multiple deep impact scars of shells on its armoured prow door as the ramp dropped. He strode inside, followed by his fellow battle brothers. He noted that the vehicle's ammunition bins were almost empty. Back to the evacuation point, he ordered the driver, and the land raider jolted violently as it reversed away, gathering speed. Corvidae immediately went to the command consoles and began to evaluate the cost of his intervention. It pained him to leave the bodies of his fallen brothers behind, but they and the Emperor would understand. This raid had become a desperate fight, and there was no time now for the customary ceremonies for the fallen and due reverence. Those must wait until they return to deliverance. Now was the time for butcher's work, and it was far from over yet. Warboss Grakrag picked up the body of a fallen space marine. Grasping it in his power-clawed hand, he hefted it up to eye level. He looked at it closely. Black armour with white trim. The symbol of a beaked flying creature emblazoned white upon it. He liked it. The colours appealed to his goth nature. No wonder they had fought so well. The Humies wore black too. It was the colour the artist boys always used. He tossed the body to his closest knob, Gorag, who caught it, staggering. Stick it on my wagon, he ordered. It was good fighting. Put him right on the front, so every scummy grot and weedy Humie can see what we did. Boss Gorag grinned and nodded his agreement. It was a worthy prize from a worthy foe. Chapter 6 Elysia's Last Stand The night's darkness was never quiet. Captain Garrick, monitoring reports and calmed chatter, stood close to his Taurus, which was hulled down, partially concealed amidst the debris. He could hear ferocious shooting off in the distance, the sounds carrying to him from the west through the still night air. Rearguard actions, sharp firefights that kept the pursuing orcs at bay, whilst the rest of shield force trailed back into the new perimeter. Every once in a while a vulture gunship would come roaring in low, a fleeting black shadow in the sky, suddenly illuminated by the muzzle flash of its weapons in a frenzy of shooting and explosions that rumbled and growled in the night. Garrick had a gritty taste of dust and gunpowder. Why gunpowder? In his mouth. He was parched and reached for the ca maybe the orcs. Maybe the orcs, I'll let that one go. He was parched and reached for the canteen on his belt, uh, dribbling out the last dregs to wet his lips. He rubbed the grit and tiredness from his eyes. It would be a long, long day when dawn finally broke. It would not take the orcs long to find them again. When they did, they would attack. It was the only way they knew. Around him, Elysian troopers crunched through the darkness amongst rubble and smashed machinery, each a study in fatigue. They were blackened and pale-faced, eyes rimmed with red. Squads had become just an ad hoc collection of stragglers and platoons had been reduced to squads by yesterday's battles. Sergeants were organising and distributing the last of the ammunition supplies. Valkyries had dropped extra canisters of ammunition just before darkness fell. Garrick's men had gathered them together, but they were all Colonel Tahoon could send. Still, it would be enough for one last fight. Drop Trooper Yano inspected the Akatran Patton Lasgun he had picked up during his retreat. He had prized it from the hands of a dead trooper. The guardsman had had his helmet and head smashed in by an orc's heavy club and was lying in a pool of pink and red gore. But Yano needed a weapon after losing his heavy bolter and the Lasgun was standard issue. 
It also relieved the gory corpse of its spare ammunition cells, two frag grenades, a ration pack, and its water canteen. At least, now, he was ready to fight again. On arrival at the rendezvous point, he had been directed to join one of the ad hoc squads being formed and found they were members of C and D Company and a medic who had discarded his medical equipment in favour of weapons. There were eight of them in all. They had been given two new power cells each and sent to man a section of perimeter. Now Yano was on sentry duty, watching the darkness for any approaching orcs and trying to stay awake. He hadn't slept in over 24 hours. He wouldn't be getting any rest for at least another 24 hours either. Captain Thanstad arrived with the last of his rearguard platoons. He had guided the unit back to the perimeter after a series of confused exchanges of fire with skulking orcs and Gretchen. The platoon was still in good fighting shape, 40 men strong, and they had done their job of keeping the orcs back. As dawn began to broach the horizon with a faint glimmer of orange, he had ordered them all back to the new perimeter. Thanstadt thought he had less than an hour before it was light enough for the orcs to attack in force. Warboss Zardsnark climbed back on to his patched-up trike. The beast would ride again. Two mechs had spent all night rebuilding the front forks. The pair hadn't had any choice. Zardsnark's ultimatum was fix it, or he would have pulled their arms off. He inspected the work. It seemed good. He bounced his weight to feel the suspension and grunted his satisfaction, much to the relief of the two mechs, who both backed away, relieved to still have all their appendages. Time to fire it up. In a throaty roar, the trike's engine sprang to life, throwing out a pleasing cloud of dirty smoke. Zardsnark revved it hard, the brakes squealing as they struggled to hold the beast in place. Yeah, just like the old beast. Zardsnark was ready to go, eager to go. Yesterday he had missed out on the fighting. Today would be his day. First to round up his boys, then at first light he would lead the charge. Buzzgob climbed into the pulpit of his stomper, uh, the big lugger. Around him the grot riggers were preparing the stomper for battle, tightening bolts and feeding more ammunition into the shooter hoppers. Some burner boys were welding new plates over yesterday's battle damage from missile strikes. Buzzgob had inspected it and was satisfied it was all superficial. Dawn was slowly arriving and Buzzgob uh, surveyed the surrounding scene. Far below him, uh, boys' mobs were gathering alongside death dreads, killer cans and trucks and tracks, battle wagons and bikers. Skalk's boys were here too, blue-faced, with teams of grots dragging cannons and big lobbers into place under the lashes of the runt herds. Behind his stomper, the Evil Sun's biker boys were racing in circles, warming up their engines under a thickening cloud of grey smoke from their exhausts. He could hear the growing thrum from the rotors of death copters and war copters, ferrying more boys to the fight. Buzzgob reflected briefly. Yesterday had been a good battle. They had given the Humies a good kicking. Today would be the real thing, a big fight. All the boys, grots and mangy squigs for miles around were here ready for the action. Far away, through the rising exhaust smog, Buzzgob could just about see the tanks and gantries of the old refinery where the Humies were hiding. That was where they would be all heading, as soon as he gave the order. He had a plan. He would lead the Dreadheads and go right. Skalk would lead his boys left, and they'd squish the Humies in the middle. Captain Corviday and Chaplain Eteth uh, both waited on the Thunderhawk gunship's ramp, in the pool of green light cast from the aircraft's interior. The entire Raven Guard strike force had now consolidated before the Thunderhawks had landed at a safe distance for the night. They would soon be airborne again. His scout squads had reported that even before first light, the Orcs had gathered into a single large horde. They had identified the Stomper, and it seemed to contain the Orcs' leader. Currently, there were too many Orcs to risk a direct assault. His space marines would obey any order he gave. But they were a precious resource, the Emperor's finest. And he would not pitch them into a battle they could not win. First, he needed the orcs to disperse from their muster point before committing. He was confident that the lure of the Elysians would do just that. Once the orcs had engaged in battle, the Raven Guard would attack. The Stomper would be their primary target. Destroy that, and they would also kill a powerful Orc warboss, maybe the overall ruler of this blighted planet. And despite the heavy losses, he could consider this ill-fated mission at least partially successful. Corvidai 
and Edith agreed that timing the assault would be critical. Wait too long and the illusions would be crushed by the orc numbers. Attack too soon and the gathered orc horde would be too strong even for his battle brothers to deal with. But the Raven Guard, everything was in place. Even their strike cruiser was in position to launch its orbital bombardment. For the time being, there was nothing to do but wait for the orcs to make their move. From there, dugouts and barricades, the tired guardsmen of the 181st Drop Troop Regiment could hear the distinctive roaring sounds and see the plumes of s exhaust smoke thrown up by the approaching bikers. Behind them was the deeper grinding and clanking sound of heavier vehicles, churning away as the orc horde approached. Captain Thanstadt uh, sprinted forwards to get a clearer view of the approaching enemy. He leapt over several fallen pipes and crouched behind another. Scanner in hand, he tracked the orcs, bikers circling to the right and left. The first stray orc bullets uh, snapped overhead, not aimed at him, just the usual overeager, firing, flying high and wild. As the first bikers appeared, uh, they were met by a volley of lasgun fire from the Elysian Ford positions. Uh, the battle had started. Thanstadt moved back into better cover and began issuing orders to engage. Then a terrifying barrage started. Mortar bombs and heavier shells plunging down all about the refinery. Steel was buckled and bent as a gantry took a direct hit and toppled down, scattering the drop troopers who were sheltering underneath it. The orcs had let fly with just about every gun they had. In response, Thanstadt flicked his comms channel to his designated air support officer. It was time for the vultures and thunderbolts to hit back. Wing Sergeant Serik eased back on the control stick, watching for a break in the smoke and clouds that spread in a heavy layer just above the ground. Several orc vehicles were already burning. His thunderbolt continued to circle, high above the battle now raging below. Awaiting the call for aid and a target grid, the pilot didn't have long to wait. He rolled the thunderbolt over into a steep dive, the G-forces building as the aircraft plummeted towards the ground. Serik felt his grav suit expanding, holding the blood in his body in place as it tried to force its way into his extremities. The thunderbolt was accelerating fast, so Serik powered down. The smoke layer rushed up to meet him. The aircraft swooped through it in a rush of air, and Serik then pulled the nose up hard, levelling out as the target came into view. A slight jink adjusted his weapon targeters as they locked on. All weapons armed? flashed across his headset. Serik thumbed the fire switch and the quad autocannons howled into life as a stream of tracer arced towards the ground. Locked in his sights was a massive lizard beast, bellowing and stomping through the rubble. At point-blank range, Serik let fly with everything. Autocannons, las cannons, and all four Hellstrike missiles ignited under the wings, simultaneously launching. Four large, armor-penetrating warheads instantly hit the creature and exploded. As Sarek wrenched back the control stick and powered up again, climbing steep and fast away from the carnage his strafing had just wrought. Bone Muncher crunched the wreckage beneath its heavy treads, still straining at its leash and bellowing. Suddenly, through the smoke, a jet fighter appeared in a howl of engines and a blaze of fire. The DACA power was impressive, even to Warboss Skalk, as the torrent of shells impacted and ricocheted around him. The aircraft flashed overhead. So low, Skalk almost ducked as he was buffeted by its jet wash. Suddenly, the world around him exploded. The volley of Hellstrike missiles turned the massive squig-off beast into hunks of flying flesh, bone and blood. Mortally wounded, the creature staggered then fell, squealing pitifully in pain as it crashed over on its side, dead before it hit the ground from massive internal wounds. The armoured howder on its back was torn off by the fall, spilling orcs in all directions before it came to rest in a mass of splintered metal. More las blasts raked across the bleeding remains of the beast as the surviving orcs tried to crawl clear of the wreckage. Trooper Yano saw one old, heavily tattooed orc duck furtively away. He tried to get him in his sights. Before he could snap off a few shots, the orc was gone. Still, it lifted the Elysian's hearts to see the thundering creature die in the devastating airstrike, and the orcs around it were already retreating in the face of their accurate steady fire. As the formation of Valkyries approached, the orcs turned their guns skywards in a barrage of fire. The first Valkyries made it through, 
but the second echelon was badly shot up. Captain Garrick watched as one aircraft's engine burst into flames, and as its drop troops hastily leapt clear, it banked away, streaming flames and smoke until it hit the ground and became an expanding ball of fire. Seconds later, a second aircraft was also shot down. The squad trapped inside the transport compartment helpless as the out-of-control Valkyrie plunged into the ground. The surviving flight screamed overhead, and from the rear of each aircraft tumbled out a cluster of small figures. Colonel Tahoon had committed the last of the regiment's reserves, the training and replacement company that had formed the airbase's security detail, but the situation on the ground had forced the colonel's hand. They needed every man that could fight. Leading the green recruits personally, Tahoon and almost 200 men had jumped from 18 Valkyries. Each drop troop's plunging grab chute dive lasted just six seconds before they hit the ground. As they did, the battle below was already ferocious. Waves of orcs were attacking and being shot down as they stormed the barricades, cutting down Elysian guardsmen in turn. Shadow Captain Corvidae's Thunderhawk was inbound, racing low over the surface, triple engines at full burn. His target was in sight. The picked relay from the Thunderhawk's augers showed it as a grainy, ill-defined image of a tall walker, the Stomper. Shells were bursting about it, but it still strode forward, slow and ungainly. Fire seemed to rain off its armour like water. As he watched, the Stomper's head exploded in a burst of light. A green energy beam leapt from its eye, crackling and fizzing before hitting a storage tank which exploded. The residue of old chemicals inside began to burn brightly. Target the head. He instructed the Thunderhawk's gunner. Corvidai unhitched his harness and made his way to the Ford ramp, beside Chaplin Eteth. Touchdown in five. The Thunderhawk pilot reported, and the prow ramp began to lower on hydraulic pistons. It clanged open just as the Thunderhawk's landing pads touched the ground and the Space Marines inside burst out. The Thunderhawk's heavy bolters were barking a stream of shells towards the Orcs as Corvidae gave the order to advance with him directly towards the Stomper. Left and right, more Thunderhawks were touching down and disgorging their passengers onto the battlefield. Alongside them, the transporters were depositing their vehicles. The Raven Guard moved forwards behind a blizzard of bolter fire. There was no headlong rush, just a steady advance. Squads fanned out, weapons levelled. A missile streaked overhead and impacted on the cab of an orc vehicle, which slewed out of control and crashed, spilling orcs from the back. The enemy's return fire was building. Bullets and shells whizzed, snapped and fizzed past. And Captain Corvidae, the occasional round ricocheting wildly off his powered armour. Behind him, the Thunderhawks lifted off again, powering skywards. The best form of defence was a strong offence. Captain Garrick remembered the ancient proverb from his Tactical Imperium schooling. His vehicles had been adding their turret weapons firepower to the ring of defence fire about the Elysian's position, but it would not be enough to hold. More orcs were coming all the time, and even as Colonel Tahoon's reinforcements were positioned to bolster the main defence lines, Garrick felt that they would not hold out all day. Climbing into the turret seat of his Taurus, he ordered his surviving squadrons to join in at his position. He would launch his own rapid counter-attack. The next time the orcs came, he would strike and try to cut through them. That would stall the assault, and if he could get through, then he would be able to make mischief in the orcs' rear area amongst their heavier gun batteries. From atop his stomper, Buzzgob could see the Space Marines and their big black aircraft landing, a new enemy. He ordered the stomper to swing right to face the new threat and bring all its weapons to bear. Fire! Fire! All the DACA we got, fire! He bellowed into the comms tube that connected his observation gantry with the control room in the head. Captain Garrick launched his attack, tyres squealing as the all-terrain vehicles accelerated and kicked up clods of dirt. Gunners opened fire in a fusillade of laser blasts. From his turret, seat Sergeant Leto took aim at a group of heavily armed blue-skinned orcs, each carrying some form of heavy weapon. There were plenty of targets to aim at as the Taurus began their assault. Leto loosed a long burst from his multi-lasers into the orcs and saw one greenskin with a white and blue skull painted on its chest come apart. First its arm was severed, then the alien's head and chest exploded in blood. The rest of the orcs scattered, ducking away into the closest cover. The Taurus had formed a line abreast and were advancing fast. At least three vehicles had already been hit. 
The blast of an explosion had flipped one clear into the air. It had landed on its roof, crushing the crew. The volume of orc fire surged around them, so many bullets that it seemed the orcs couldn't miss. Leto felt Round's impact on the turrets, and then Round punctured the turret armor and hit him, piercing his right thigh. Immediately, blood started to well up through his jumpsuit and run down into his boot. The pain almost overcame him. He howled, stifled his scream, then almost passed out, fighting to stay conscious. He was barely aware that the Taurus had rolled to a halt. In front of him, the driver was already dead. Bouncing along at high speed, the orc bikers were shooting frantically in all directions. The howling engines and roar of shooters drowned out everything. Zartznak saw a rocket zip past, felt the concussion of its near miss. It was a wild melee and Zartznak loved it. Amidst the din, there was the grunting and screaming of orcs and humies dying. In the chaos, his trike had been hit again. The front tyre was flat. A rubber was peeling away in strips. Other bits had fallen off too. And the beast's jet engine didn't sound good. But he just kept going. The speeding bikers were proving hard to hit as they swirled around the rusted wreckage of pipes and rubble. The evil son's war boss had the ripper powered up and used it to slash wildly at anything within reach. Bits of machinery and pipe were locked off in a shower of sparks. Several humies had also been locked into bits. He'd taken one's head clean off, and Zardstark had laughed hard as it bounced away like a ball. Captain Garrick's Taurus was wheezing to a halt, having taken multiple rounds through it. His driver was bleeding badly. Shell fragments had slashed Garrick's face as well. The communications equipment was shot, shredded, sparking and smouldering. Garrick climbed out, staggering. Bullets were still cracking by. He helped his driver, Ardo, out, but the wound looked serious. About him, Garrick could see more orcs and Gretchen closing in. He drew his last pistol and fired to keep them back, still supporting his driver with one arm. Let's get out of here, he reassured the man, even though it didn't look like Aldo was going to live long. Captain Garrick turned to make his way back the way he had come, but found his path was blocked by more glowering orcs. He was already surrounded. The orc mob closed in, swords, axes, and pistols in hand. Shadow Captain Corviday had withdrawn into his Land Raider Prometheus command post. The vehicle had caught up with him through the battle outside, and he needed to check on all his squads. The Raven Guard ground assault had run into trouble when orc dreadnoughts had counterattacked. Small ones, big ones, just about anything that could stagger on legs had charged headlong into the Raven Guard's ranks. The Space Marines had been forced to withdraw and call in their own air support. Thunderhawks were even now strafing the orcs to keep them back. They hadn't reached the Stomper, and it was still out there, thundering away with volleys of fire and blasting its green laser light. Suddenly, the Land Raider shook violently beneath him, almost wrenching Corviday off his feet. The battle tank slewed sideways, then a second impact almost lifted the 70-ton vehicle off the ground. Corviday scrambled to the side exit, hit the emergency open button, and the Land Raider's door exploded outwards. The vehicle was being shaken from side to side. Leaping through the door, Corviday looked back. A huge dreadnought, at least six metres tall, loomed over the Prometheus. Its massive power claw was raking across the top of the Land Raider, piercing the top armour and tearing a great gouge through it. The huge dreadnought pulled away armoured pieces and discarded them. Helplessly, the stricken tank was being violently demolished. Captain Thanstadt had climbed to a vantage point on the still-smoking ruins of a storage tank, clambering up the remains of the ladders to get a clear view. All around and below him, the drop troopers and orcs were still locked in battle. Above him, aircraft soared and roared, both Elysian and Orc, bringing their payloads of rockets and bombs to add to the raging inferno of battle below. From up here, he had a better view of what was happening. Through the smoke, he could still plainly see. Away to the south, the squat shapes of Space Marine Thunderhawk gunships making their attack runs. Amidst the smoke was the distant, hazy outline of the Orc Stomper. The Space Marine's landing had mercifully diverted its own advance. 
As he watched through his magnocular scanner, a streak of red fire raced from the upper sky and flashed into the ground, impacting in a great explosion. The Space Marine's orbital bombardment. The cloud of dust and debris thrown up obscured his view further. Closer by, the Elysians were down to the last of their manpower. Squads and platoons had been butchered to a man by the repeated orc charges and overwhelmed by the orc's heavy firepower. Captain Garrick's A Company had been destroyed. Garrick himself was lost, missing, presumed dead. His own F Company was down to the last 30 or 40 survivors. Not even a full-strength platoon remained. The other companies were similarly shredded. Colonel Tyhoon was also dead, killed, fighting off another charge by the orc bikers. That left Thanstad in overall command of the regiment, which wasn't much of a promotion. Still, around his perimeter, the bodies of orcs had piled up, three or four deep in places. Wrecked and burning orc vehicles, bikes, trucks and battle wagons added to the carnage. Captain Thanstad had now resigned himself to their defeat and destruction. And as a last resort, he had called in the Valkyrie transports to make a last-ditch effort to lift any survivors they could clear from the battlefield. It would be a dangerous mission, almost suicidal, as the Valkyries would be vulnerable as they came into land. The entire area was infested with marauding greenskins. The regiment was beaten, though, and there was no choice but to make an emergency evacuation back to their base. No doubt the Orcs fighters would pursue them all the way. All squads to break contact and withdraw. Thunderhawks, disengage and prepare for extraction to strike cruiser. They were not orders Shadow Captain Corvidae had expected to have to give. But there was nothing more his depleted strike force could do here. The Elysians had been overrun and his own force faced the same prospect, unless they got clear now. They had failed to destroy the Stomper or find the Orc commanders. But to continue a hopeless battle and waste the lives of his brothers would be a greater dishonour than any failure here. There was no disgrace or dishonour in giving battle with determination and valour and expunging hundreds of these green Xenos from the galaxy in the name of the Emperor. Still, Captain Corvidae would have to bear the mark of his failure until he could erase it with a greater victory. He would do long penance for these two days. Perhaps he would volunteer for a period of service with the Ordo Xenos as a fitting self-imposed exile. Chapter 7. Defeat and Withdrawal. The End of the Castral Novum Raid. They rode back in the Valkyrie in silence. There was nothing left to say and no more orders to give. On the outward trip, each Valkyrie had been packed with men, drop canisters and extra equipment. Now the transport compartment seemed empty. Captain Thanstad had boarded the last Valkyrie to make the rescue run. In the process, they had taken a lot of ground fire from the Orcs, but the pilot had blasted them clear. Now it was touch and go if the aircraft would make it back to base at all. There were just five other guardsmen with Captain Thanstad. Each looked like they had been seriously beaten, with their bruised faces and red swollen eyes. Most were still bleeding from wounds. The transport compartment floor was a mess of discarded equipment and blood-soaked bandages. Thanstad himself could feel blood slowly oozing from a shallow wound on his hip, where a shard of shrapnel had skimmed just past him. Earlier during the battle, he had hardly noticed the wound. Now it ached. But then, what muscles didn't after two days in combat? He would live, which was more than they could say for most of the drop troopers who had been led onto Castrol Novum. Trooper Yano was struck by how empty the airbase was now. When they had boarded the Valkyries for the attack, the place had been a frenzy of activity and noise as thousands of men and hundreds of aircraft made ready for battle. Now it was almost deserted, just a few mute stragglers and the gusting wind whipping across the sand and rock. There were few people left now, mostly maintenance crews and labourers, the men who had been part of the regiment's support echelon, but even most of these had now been lifted back to the transport in orbit. Yano threw down his sweat-soaked helmet and began unstrapping his flak armor's breastplate and pauldrons. There were scorch marks on the breastplate, and in one place a huge dent, front and centre, where an orc bullet had hit him square on, but the symphiplas had stopped it, barely. He could feel the big bruise on his chest from the impact. It should have killed him. 
Around him, the survivors were doing likewise, shedding the heavy equipment. Some were methodically field stripping their weapons, a force of habit too ingrained to stop even at the point of exhaustion. Other troopers had simply slumped down and fallen asleep. There would be more work to do when the orbital landers returned to lift them back to the transports. But it was obvious there weren't enough guardsmen left to dismantle and reload the equipment in the aircraft that arrived here. Many of the surviving aircraft would have to be sabotaged beyond use by the enemy and abandoned. The battle was over, but Shadow Captain Corviday's work was not complete. They still had the evacuation mission to complete. His battle brothers had returned to their strike cruiser, but the remaining Elysians also had to be lifted clear. He had already dispatched the orbital landers to their airbase to begin the operation. The heavy equipment was to be destroyed and left. Corviday wanted to be away from the system quickly before any orc ships arrived to intercept them. He was confident that the strike cruiser was fast enough to outrun anything the orcs might pursue them with, but the transport vessels would need protecting until they could make their warp jumps. Of the three transport vessels that had arrived, two had already been dispatched, empty. The remaining vessel would be more than enough for the Imperial Guard survivors. The Battle Fortress rumbled to a halt in a screech of brakes. The big, black-clad Goths clambered and jumped down from it, searching for an enemy to shoot at. Before them was a scene of smoking ruin. Bodies littered the ground, Humies, Orc and Grots. Fires were burning out of control. Somewhere inside one of those fires, ammunition was still exploding. One loud detonation after another. Cordite smoke was thick in the air. War boss Grakrag inhaled deeply. He loved it. The place looked good. There were few sights as magnificent as a battlefield after a battle. Flanked by his minders, he crunched over the rubble to investigate closer. As he arrived, he had seen the last of the Humi's aircraft blasting off and racing away. It was too late. He had arrived too late for the fight, which angered him greatly. His convoy had sped all day to get here, but they couldn't make up the time lost in yesterday's fighting. Surveying the surrounding area, it looked like it had been a good scrap. He noted with satisfaction the charred, fleshy remains of Skalk's big squig-off lying dead. Good. With Gork's luck, uh, the crooked old git had got himself killed. Which would be one problem Grakrag wouldn't have to deal with when it came to splitting up all the loot. He turned back to his boys and ordered them back onto the battle fortress. It was time to find Buzzgob, and he'd better still be alive or boss Garakak uh, would make sure they were all dead. Buzzgob was still inspecting the battle damage on his stomper, high up on its head. He was peering deeply into the burnt out and twisted remains of its weapon, the Gaze of Gork, they called it, but the laser had taken a direct hit from one of the Humi's big guns and been turned into charred scrap. Most of the workings had been fused into one big mess of cables and gubbins, and its insides were still sparking and glowing red hot. He took out his large wrench and began pulling pieces off to see if anything could be saved. The rest of Big Lugger had weathered the battle pretty well. In places, the armoured skirts had been torn away, and one shot had penetrated through and mangled some of the leg workings, including a few grot riggers that had been caught by the explosion. Their bits were splattered all over the place in there. A lot of working bits had shaken loose, and the riggers were already busy tightening up bolts before anything vital dropped off. He gave up on the laser. Time for that later. First, he had to get his boys and mechs plundering any scrap they could get their hands on. To the victor, the spoils. And Buzzgob knew he had definitely won this battle. Epilogue The raid on Castral Novum had been a costly defeat for the Imperium, even for the vaunted Space Marines of the Raven Guard. There was little of positive value to salvage from the slaughter wrought by the Orcs. Before the attack, the 181st Elysian Drop Troop Regiment had been a well-equipped and trained Imperial Guard Force, with a good mix of veterans and new recruits. The Departmento Munitorum had rated its combat readiness as optimum when it received its orders for transportation to the Forsar Sector. It was that optimum rating that had seen it selected for the Castral Nova mission at the Raven Guard's request. In two days of fighting, it had effectively been destroyed. Very few of the regiment's 2,100 men 
and almost none of its equipment, including over 100 Valkyrie airborne carriers and 30 Vulture gunships, were evacuated from Castrol Nova. Perhaps as few as 400 guardsmen returned. Departmento Munitorum auditors for the Forsar sector struck the regiment off its strength at 548992 M41. Elysia's next round of conscriptions would see the regiment refounded with fresh manpower and new equipment provided. The 181st Drop Troop Regiment would fight again, but it would contain no veterans of Castrol Novum. Many of the survivors were transferred to the 73rd Harkoni Warhawks as reinforcements. The Raven Guard's plan had failed. It had cost Strike Force Corvide over 70 of its battle brothers. They had come close, but ultimately failed in their primary objective of killing Big Mech Buzzgob. In some circles of the Segmentum High Command, the chapter would come in for strong criticism for its failure and the perceived waste of an Imperial Guard drop troop regiment that could have been better employed elsewhere. But such voices were to be rapidly silenced when the chapter deployed to Forsar itself, although some would suggest that the chapter's delayed deployment to the war zone to meet Garrick Hack's main force only came about as a result of their failure on Castrol Novum and their need to atone for the heavy losses incurred. Other commanders argued that perhaps the raid had not been a complete failure. An estimated 6,000 orcs had been killed in the fighting. None of them would now see battle elsewhere. Manufacturing on the world would be disrupted by the loss of manpower, if nothing else. The Raven Guard had also destroyed a huge fuel stockpile, and this in turn must have had some knock-on effect on the Forsar battles. In the end, history would show that the damage inflicted would not be enough to save the Hive World from being conquered by Garakak's armies. In truth, these arguments were merely small compensations to be salvaged from a mission that had gone badly wrong. The major mistake had been the underestimating of Orcs' strength. The raiders had simply not had the manpower to deal with the massive number of Orcs present on Castrol Novum. It was a failure that had dogged the Imperium's fight against Garagak since his first surprise attack. It took the fall of Forsar and then Magdalene IV before the Administratum finally recognised Garagak's attacks as a full war. When arguably, it had been exactly that since his victory in the Talarax War. The wheels of the Imperium's bureaucracy had been characteristically slow to react. For the Orcs, the raid was a brief distraction from the main battlefield on Forsar, and if nothing else, it signalled the Imperium's willingness to go on the offensive and operate deep in Orc territory, even if the risks and losses were great. Garakak's growing domain was not secure from the speed and mobility of the Space Marine chapters. Following the raid, Garakak sent one of his own trusted goth warbands to Castrol Novum as new guards to replace the losses, and to keep a much closer eye on Buzzgob. At Garakak's urging, the mech boss would eventually leave his base on Mech Slag X and take to the battlefield again at the head of the Dreadheads. Buzzgob's dread mob led the invasion and capture of the Magdalene IV Shrine World. Skalk Bluetooth and his Death Skulls also joined Buzzgob, but only once Skalk had completed the task of creating his own dread mob, his experiment with Squigoffs was consigned to history as a failure in favour of imitating Buzzgob's impressive mechanical warband. Zardsnark's biker boys would replace their losses and eventually move on to Forsar to join the war. Over the course of that war, Zardsnark would rise to become one of Garakak's most feared war bosses, and by the end of the Forsar conquest, he would be leading an Evil Sons warband that ran to an estimated 50,000 orcs, making him Garakak's most powerful Evil Sons war boss. Grakrag too would survive Warlord Garakak's anger at the raid's destruction and disruption, and finally get his wish to see battle on Forsar. Once it was complete, he would take command of the Gargant, naming it Grakrag's Mangler. The Stratagos Logis still have the Gargant listed on their inventory of Garakak's known forces. Postscript: The lessons of the raid on Castrol Novum were not quickly learned. After the fall of Magdalene IV, the Adeptus Ministorum was vehement that their shrine world should not be allowed to remain in Orc hands without a fight. They used their political influence to insist on an immediate counterattack. The regiment selected for this mission was the 73rd Harkoni Warhawks, another newly deployed optimum rated drop troop regiment. But this time the attack was not supported by any space marines. 
The Raven Guard refused to have any involvement in such a rashly conceived mission. They at least had learned a lesson. The Warhawks' drop on Magdalene IV was another disaster. That drop troop regiment too was wiped out for little or no gain. It marked the last of the Imperium's attempted counterattacks against Garakak. The wasting of forces in the piecemeal small actions was ordered to halt. The main effort must be in building up enough force to halt the Orcs' invasion in defensive battles before any further attempts at reconquest would be sanctioned. The Growth of War Garakak The following is a timeline of events from the formation of Garakak's initial horde uh, to its current standing in the Forsar sector as the 41st millennium came to an end just prior to the fall of the Cadian Gate. Most benevolent lord of the administratum, I beseech thee. For over 70 years, the emperor's divine rule of the Forsar sector of Segmentum Tempestus has been threatened and harassed by a growing orc menace. The arch-killer, Garakak, name him not, the cruelest of foes. May his name be forever cursed. Even now, these unholy Xenos sit upon the cardinate throne of the holy shrine world of Magdalene IV, blaspheming his name with their foul presence. As I write, orc foot soldiers are barracked in the ruins of our once glorious hive cities. Our faithful citizens are enslaved to his alien will. How long must we endure these torments? How many more worlds must fall before this green fiend soldiery? How many loyal citizens must be sacrificed before the enemy's cruel reign is halted? Send us stoic soldiers of the Imperial Guard. Send us legions of the faithful Adeptus Sororitas. Send us your most revered Adeptus Astartes. Send us your aid. In the Emperor's name, preserve us, your most faithful servants. A Lord Confessor, Martana Javun. Petition to the Master of the Administratum 994999M41. Timeline of events. 170936M41. Garakak's Goth Horde, allied with the Bad Moons of Dagrod's Killer Boys, launched a surprise attack on the outpost world of Thoria Free and rapidly defeat its garrison and enslave its population. 346937M41. Success on Thoria draws more Orc warbands to Garakak and Dagrod's banners, including Bad Doc. Fisk Skullsplitter's Renegade Warband of Cyborgs, Zargo's Flyboys, Blackfinger's Death Skulls, and many wandering freebooter bands. 031939, M41. Warlord Garakak treacherously attacks his former ally Dagrod. Slaying Dagrod, the Killboys join his warband. Garakak is now the undisputed Orc leader on Thoria Free. 772945, M41. The Departmento Munitorum responds to the increased orc threat by deploying five Imperial Guard regiments to Talarax, turning it into a fortress world. 289948, M41. Garakak's enlarged fleet enters the Talarax system and overwhelms the planet's fleet and orbital defenses. Landings begin on Talarax itself. 348948, M41. Landing is complete, a three year ground war for possession of Talarax begins. 608951, M41. Talarax finally falls to Garakak. To celebrate his victory, he reinforces the armor on his personal battle fortress with masonry taken from Talarax's bastions. Garakak declares himself the overfiend of Talarax. 064951, M41. With Garakak's permission, Big Mech Buzzgob and his Dreadheads warband lead an attack on the Imperial Industrial World of Castral Novum. 723-952-M41 After strong resistance by Castral Novum's garrison, including the 49th Terex Guard, the planet is evacuated and falls. Mech Boss Buzzgob establishes himself on Castral Novum, turning it into his own manufacturing base. It is renamed Mech Slag X by the Orcs. 453960 M41 
Blackfinger's Death Skull's fleet split from Garakak to attack the small forest world of Viridius Prime. An Eldar fleet intercepts Blackfinger in the Viridius system and destroys the Orc fleet. No Orcs reach Viridius. 211-966-M41 Warboss Gokrog arrives from the Orc Empire of Octavius to challenge Garakak, backed by his own large fleet including a massive Space Hulk. Garakak fights Gokrog and wins the duel, inheriting his entire horde and fleet. 799-70-M41 Garakak continues to attract more Orc warbands, swelling his forces further including Logrock's Bad Moons, Speedlord Vakrakas Blitzboys, Nazgrag's Kill Convoy, Krog's Bloodaxe Armoured Brigade, and Nashrak's Freaks. Small Orc raids across the Forsar system continue, but it is obvious Garakak is mustering his forces for his next big invasion. 935979, M41. Departamento Munitorum officials order more Imperial Guard regiments to defend Forsar Hiveworld, their logis predictions make Forsar the next target for Garakak's conquests. 705988 M41 Garakak launches his long expected invasion of Forsar. Millions of orcs rampage across the hive world in a war which will eventually last eight years. 541992 M41 Raid on Castral Novum. A Raven Guard strike force and the Elysian. 181st Drop Troop Regiment attack Garakak's manufacturing base on Castral Novum. A two-day battle results in heavy losses to the Imperium's forces. Despite the Raven Guard's efforts to kill him, Mech Boss Buzzgob survives. 296994 M41 Siege of Cesaro Prime Hive on Forsar ends with the Hive falling as Garakak's overwhelming numbers storm the defences. The 227th Mordium Regiment is annihilated in the 10-day pitched battle. 870995 M41 On Forsar, a Raven Guard strike force under Shadow Captain Shrike counterattack at the 89th Parallel, encircling and largely destroying Wax Scrum's Dacker Boys, a large blood axe led warband. 023996M41 Big Mech Buzzgob launches his own invasion from Castral Novum against the shrine world of Magdalene IV. His dreadheads are aided by Skalk Bluetooths, Death Skulls and more goth warbands sent by Garakak. The shrine world is defended by Frataris Militia, thousands of cultists of the Red Redemption and Sisters of Battle of the Order of the Black Sepulchre. 411996M41 The Fall of Forsar it is renamed Garakak's World. For the Imperial Guard's High Command, the loss of the primary hive world now makes the sector indefensible. Imperial Guard forces are redeployed en masse, abandoning the Forsar sector despite vehement complaints from ecclesiarchal representatives. They demand the Imperium defend the Shrine World of Magdalene IV to the last man. 866-966-M41 Without aid, Magdalene IV falls to Buzzgob and his immediately claimed by Garakak, now calling himself the Warlord of Forsar. Snakebite warbands of Gursk's Braves join with Garakak, emerging from their home planet of Ogrola, a deep in an area of wilderness space. Aided by Garakak, the entire population of the planet migrates to join the war, including hundreds of squiggoffs. 476998M41 Under diplomatic pressure from the Ecclesiarchy to rapidly recapture Magdalene IV, the 73rd Harkoni Warhawks are ordered to launch an ill-advised counter-offensive against the Shrine World. The attack fails with heavy losses. 995-999-M41 Garakak's ongoing invasions are officially designated as Wah Garakak by the Administratum. Garakak's warbands are now estimated at approximately 2 billion Orcs. Seems a lot, doesn't it? His hordes are now all mustering on Garakak's world. Mechslag X and Magdalene IV. 996-999-M41 More Imperial Guard regiments along with large ecclesiarchal forces as well as a demi-legion of Legio Titanicus Astramana, the Morning Stars, are now being deployed to halt the Orcs. 
Space Marines of the Revilers, Aurora and Death Eagles chapter have also arrived. The entire Raven Guard chapter stands ready to defend their homeworld, Deliverance, which now lies in the predicted path of Wah Garakak. Unfortunately, at this point, the information runs out. We do not know the current situation of Deliverance, only that it must have defeated Garakak's horde at some point. Shortly after this, Kadia fell, the Great Rift emerged, and our beloved Imperial Regent, the Primarch Gilliman, emerged, and his Primaris Marines were dispatched across the galaxy. We do know from other sources that the Raven Guard are currently utilizing the new Marines. I shall update you further when more information becomes available. Transmission ends. And there we have it, another big campaign video. More will be coming soon. Thank you to everybody supporting the channel. Apologies about the uh, delays. I've tried my best. This one took a long time to pull together. I don't know why. It took longer than normal. I'm not sure. But anyway, it's out now. So I hope you do enjoy it. Thank you to everybody supporting the channel. You can see your name scrolling by as I babble here. Good little story. Some of the artwork is amazing. It's a shame some of this... There's, it's a shame that so much stuff that Forge World used to make just isn't available anymore. Particularly the Orc stuff, the Orc tanks and everything. And a lot of the Space Marine stuff. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. But yeah, lots of nice uh, nice, nice artwork and imagery and stuff. And it's a shame, man. I, I really want them to do more of these sort of campaign books like they did with the... Um, the Sabbath World's Crusade one, but that was a sort of mostly a reprint of an old book with a few additions, like updating it from Dan Abner. I want I want more of these campaign books that are in depth. I mean, um, yeah, they're just they're just good fun, you know. Fake history, I like fake history. The uh, Tactica Imperialis with all its multiple campaign histories and stuff in there, it's good stuff. Anyway, this is a this is an interesting one. There's a few odd moments. Again, this is like sort of twelve years old. This campaign, so again. Some of the numbers are off. Like, all of a sudden, the orcs get t t 2 billion. That's a lot. That's a lot of orcs. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying it's not possible, but it seems like that es that escalated quickly, right? Um, you know, the amount of space marines that died, I guess killing 6,000 orcs isn't bad, is it? That's a lot of orcs. But anyway, interesting campaign. Nice little bonus one. And uh, I hope you did enjoy it. And like I say, if, if you would like to support the channel and the work I do here, please consider using the links below. Become a YouTube member, which is probably the easiest thing. Either on Patreon, which I appreciate. Join one of the tiers there. And uh, on Subscribestar as well. For those of you who prefer that, I really appreciate it. I will be back again with more stuff very, very soon. And uh, yeah, if you wouldn't mind giving the video a like. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. Let me know in the comments what you thought. I'll be back again very, very soon with much more stuff. As we go on towards the, the Christmas time now of 2022. Much more stuff coming up. Yeah, don't worry. Content is coming. See you later. Bye-bye.